General Butt Naked, a.k.a. Joshua Bly, a.k.a. just one of the many, many warlords that would form child armies and battle for power during the tumultuous and bloody First Liberian Civil War, which lasted from 1989 to 1997. During the 90s, most of Liberia was controlled by numerous and incredibly violent rival militias. In the bush, they battled for control of diamond mines and gold mines. In Monrovia, they fought gun battles in the streets. Some of these warring factions were led by, or at least assisted by, brutal warriors and warlords who adopted outlandish names like Chuck Norris, One Foot Devil, General Mosquito, his nemesis General Mosquito Spray, not kidding. And of course, there was General Butt Naked, perhaps the most brutal of all the warlords. Butt Naked was active for about three years, and he led several dozen soldiers, uh, the Naked Commandos, who fought mostly in Monrovia, sometimes more than several dozen soldiers. Many of his soldiers were children. Child soldiers fed a steady diet of cocaine and American action movies. Kids forced to kill and also eat other kids. Today's story is so, so crazy. Liberia in the 90s was so crazy. General Butt Naked said he had a vision when he was 11 years old where he was told by a tribal god that he would become a great warrior and that he should practice human sacrifice and cannibalism to increase his power and become impossible to kill. And he seems to have taken this vision very seriously. Or maybe he made it up to try and rationalize and justify all the atrocities he committed to others. About 10 years after his first major vision, Bly claims to have experienced another vision, a divine Christian vision that transformed him from a mass murderer into a man of God. And ever since that event, he's committed his life to trying to right the wrongs he made in the past. But is it genuine? Is he really a man of God? Or is he just a con man doing whatever he feels he needs to do in order to thrive in an extremely difficult place for someone with almost no formal education to even just survive? During times of war, he became a warlord. During times of peace, he's become a man of God. Something about it feels very convenient. General Butt Naked is a complicated man, and Liberia is a complicated nation. And we explore the man, the country he comes from, and so much more on today's warmongering, death-defying, eye-opening, so much insane shit packed into one edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. Work can wait for this one. Uh, hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. I'm Dan Cummins, suck nasty, Optimus suck, suck Norris, and you are listening to Time Suck. And how do you feel about skipping announcements today and just getting right into so much show? All in favor, say hail Nimrod. Okay. All right, let's do it. Uh, holy shit, I got sucked in hard to the topic this week. Uh, let's head to Liberia on the west coast of Africa to suck a civil war, two of them in fact, the founding of a nation, and the life of a brutal warlord who once went by the name of General Butt Naked, a man who claimed that fighting naked made him immune to bullets. Uh, pretty sure that's not totally true, but maybe kind of true. I mean, seeing a wild-eyed naked dude carrying a machine gun or a machete running at you in some urban war zone, I mean, that might give a lot of people pause, throw their shot off. Uh, Before we get to know Mr. Butt Naked, uh, we first will familiarize ourselves with Liberia, where our story takes place, an extremely unique and fascinating and oftentimes completely horrific African nation, a nation that has been a living hell for far too many of its people to live in. Uh, Then we'll look at Liberia's culture of warlords, how they operate, how the concept of warlords is not unique to Africa. It's uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Before we then examine the interesting spiritual beliefs that gave Bly, uh, you know, his his beliefs that pushed him towards human sacrifice. If the beliefs are true, that's a that's a whole thing we'll look into as well. Then we'll jump into this week's time suck timeline following Liberia's two civil wars. Uh, Both were fought in the past 30 years, and we'll also follow uh, Joshua Bly's life and get to know some other brutal military leaders. I hope you find all of this as interesting as I do. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. This week's information is going to take us across the world to a continent we don't visit nearly as often as we probably should here on the suck, Antarctica. Uh, Kitty, we're visiting Africa, of course. Uh, we don't visit Antarctica very often, uh, and we never will. It's a frozen, barren wasteland, and I don't care enough about penguins or seals to talk about them for over two hours. 
Uh, we don't visit Africa enough. Lots of good stories in Africa. Loads of interesting people in history. Uh, specifically today, as I said, we're heading to Liberia, smaller African nation along the continent's West Atlantic coast, just south of Sierra Leone, just north of the Ivory Coast. Liberia is perhaps the most unique nation on the entire continent in terms of its modern origin story. It's the only black state in Africa never to have been subjected to colonial rule. It's also Africa's oldest republic. And the troubled nation, uh, yeah, such a strange origin, such, such strange beginnings. Uh, Liberia was established on land acquired for freed U.S. slaves by the American Colonization Society, which founded a colony at Cape Mezzerado in 1822. This cape is located where the capital city of Monrovia sits today. The society, the ACS, also known as the Society for the Colonization of Free People of Color of America, was founded in 1816 in Washington, D.C. by one Robert Finley. A Princeton grad, Finley was a Presbyterian minister who worked as a pastor for two decades in Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, also teaching at a boys' academy before becoming the president of the University of Georgia shortly before his death in 1817. And Finley founded, along with Samuel John Mills, a congressional minister from Connecticut and a Christian missionary, the ACS, in order to relocate free American uh, blacks to a colony in West Africa. The society quickly gained support from some abolitionists and also from most slaveholders for very different reasons. Some white abolitionists truly seem to have noble intentions when it came to African colonization. They believed that African Americans, due to both slavery in the South and discrimination in the North, would never find the happiness, freedom, and fulfillment in America that they could find in their own new nation in West Africa. Other, much less noble Americans in the North and slaveholders in the South just wanted free black Americans to get the fuck out. They feared them. They were worried that if left, if left to their own devices in America, they might lead slavery rebellions and revolts, or they would want equal rights to vote and own their own land, or heaven forbid, uh, black men might want to romantically pursue white women. The horror! Oh my heck! This notion of the racially motivated exportation of free black people to Africa was actually not a new idea. Uh, America took a page out of the playbook of its own former colonial masters, the British, for this one. In 1787, Britain had founded the colony of Freetown in Sierra Leone. Uh, they sent the Black Poor of London there. The organization that led relocation efforts was called the Committee for the Relief of the Black Poor. Only 38 initial, initial settlers were originally shipped off. A few years later, in 1792, 1,100 former American slaves living in then-British-controlled Nova Scotia, tired of both the weather and racial discrimination, sailed in 15 ships to Freetown. Then in 1815, Paul Cuffey, a successful American Quaker ship owner and activist based in Boston, financed taking 38 American free blacks to head to Freetown as well. He's the man who laid the foundation for the American Colonization, colonization Society. And until 1961, Sierra Leone would be a British colony. Uh, despite similar beginnings, Liberia's settlement history, very different than Sierra Leone's. It was never really a colony of the U.S. It's referred to that in a, a lot of uh, videos online and some articles, but not accurate in my opinion. It received some grant money from the U.S. to get started, but it was never a proper colony. Uh, more of an experiment, really, run by the ACS, uh, not really ran by the United States. The initial American settlement was named Christopolis in 1822. Then in 1824, the colony around Christopolis was named Liberia, as in Liberty. And the initial settlement was re uh, renamed to Monrovia, uh, renamed from Christopolis to Monrovia after James Monroe, the president of the U.S. at the time, uh, who was a big supporter of this colony. Monroe was all about sending free black slaves and ex-Caribbean slaves to Liberia. Uh, he saw this as a preferable option to emancipation. So kind of fucked up that the city is named after him, that it's still named after him. It's named after a guy who did not want to have freed African slaves living in America. He wanted to ship them out away from the States and back across the Atlantic. You know, just this, uh, uh, thanks for all the help in building our economy and making our nation strong enough to never have to worry about being brought to heel by the British, my black brothers and sisters. Now, with all due respect, please get the fuck out. Uh, in addition to Monroe, other early presidents, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, uh, big supporters of the ACS. Madison was actually the American Colonization Society's president in the early 1830s. Uh, you know who were not big supporters of the ACS uh, and being shipped off to Africa? Almost all African-Americans, uh, at least not freed American black citizens. Uh, almost none of them very excited about this plan. 
famed abolitionist Frederick Douglass, commenting on colonization plans, summed up African-American sentiment at the time, saying, shame upon the guilty wretches that dare propose and all that continents such a pro proposition. We live here, have lived here, have a right to live here, and mean to live here. Many African-Americans viewed colonization as a means of defrauding them of rights of citizenship and a way of tightening the grip of Southern slavery. But faced with dire economic and social prospects continually diminished by racial discrimination in America, a way many of them would go anyways. Over 2,600 freed American slaves would settle in Liberia in the first decade of its colonization, uh, perhaps as many as 5,000, and life for them not easy. The swampy land was rife with malaria. Uh, the local natives not overjoyed to see them show up. Uh, no local tribal leaders were interested in the settlement and armed conflicts were common in the early years. But the new settlers were able to consistently fight off attacks. Uh, by 1843, 4,571 African-Americans uh, at least had settled in Liberia and Monrovia. Four years later, on July 26, 1847, the americo liberian settlers, as they become known, took control of the colony over from the ACS. They declared themselves independent from the society and from the U.S. They modeled their flag after the U.S. flag. They modeled their system of government and their constitution after the U.S., and they were a new internationally recognized nation. And they quickly consolidated power and would proceed to dominate the nation for 133 years. Another 168 settlers would arrive during the U.S. Civil War and almost 2,500 more in the first five years following the Civil War. All in all, somewhere between 12 and 13,000 black settlers would arrive in Liberia from America in those colonization years. And the way these settlers, these freed slaves, integrated with local tribes was pretty fucked up. Uh, the americo liberian settlers were, from the beginning, essentially American rather than African in outlook and orientation. They retained preferences for Western modes of dress, Southern plantation-style homes, American food, Christianity, the English language and monogamous kinship practices. The settlers held land individually in contrast to the communal ownership of the African population and their political institutions, again, modeled on the U.S. They had an elected president, a legislature made up of a Senate and House of Representatives, a Supreme Court. Uh, they seldom intermarried with indigenous Africans and tried to influence the interior inhabitants, primarily through uh, evangelism and trade. And all this makes sense to me. I mean, these settlers were American. American culture is what they knew. Here's the fucked up part. These freed slaves from America treated the locals much like their former slave owners had treated them. Racism reproduced itself in the minds of the oppressed and they became the oppressors. The former victims became the victimizers. The americo Liberians saw the natives the way whites had seen them. Once the americo Liberians were rulers, they sadly mimicked white American rule in the worst of ways. They justified their exploitation of the natives on the basis of cultural inferiority, just as whites used racism to justify slavery. In America, race trumped all other considerations, and in Liberia, culture now trumped race as the classification of inferiority. Uh, in a very interesting book about all of this, Slaves to Racism, An Unbroken Chain from America to Liberia, the authors... Uh, sociologists and anthropologists Benjamin Dennis and Anita Dennis refer to the way Americo Liberians behaved as an imitation of superiority. Many Americo Liberians mimicked and retained the culture of the antebellum South because they derived their cultural superiority from it. Ironically, they replicated what they despised, oppression and, disc and discrimination based on inferiority. Natives were disparaged and ridiculed as country people. Uh, the americo Liberians set up all the Jim Crow laws of the American South in Liberia. Like, how fucking crazy is that? Uh, they instituted social segregation in the capital city of Monrovia and elsewhere. Uh, most of the americo Liberians did live in Monrovia. Among other things, natives could not enter through the front doors of americo Liberian businesses. They couldn't vote. Uh, they couldn't even speak unless spoken to, unless they wanted to risk punishment. There were sexual restrictions. No native man could marry or have any type of sexual relationship with an americo liberian woman. Uh, many, over the next 100 years or so, would be put to work as forced laborers, as slaves, really, by the americo liberians Even when natives became educated, they were restricted from almost all government positions, only a token few allowed to participate at all for over a century of rule. And decades of this type of discrimination and oppression would lead to the bloody civil wars of recent decades. It would lead to the rise of ruthless warlords like General Butt Naked. Fascinating, right? 
Thinking about this led me to examining the psychological factors that create a cycle of abuse, right? Where the abused becomes the abuser. Not all victims of abuse will go on to abuse others, but studies do suggest that about a third will, pretty high number, and studies have shown that certain factors have been found to worsen the long-term impact of abuse and make it more difficult to break the chain, including abuse that started early in life, abuse that lasted a long time, abuse in which the perpetrator had a close relationship to the victim, abuse that the child experienced as particularly harmful, and abuse that occurred within a cold familial environment. So when you have all these factors, it seems like you know uh, more than a third of people who've experienced this are going to go from abused to abuser. Now think about these factors in the context of American plantation slavery. Life for a plantation slave, particularly someone born into it, nothing but abuse. Forced labor and beatings. Abuse that started early in life, check. Started from birth. Abuse that lasted a long time, check. Never ended. There was no protection from it. Abuse in which the perpetrator had a close relationship to the victim, check. The abuser owned the victim. Pretty close relationship. Abuse of child experience that was particularly harmful, big check. Beaten with whips, rape, super harmful. Uh, abuse that occurred with a cold fam- within a cold familial environment, check. Having your entire family owned by people who think you are intellectually and morally inferior, people who see you as less than human, pretty fucking cold. Uh, your owners were your family in many ways, and they were cold as fuck. Based on all of this, I can see how it was pretty easy, psychologically speaking, for far more than a third of the former slaves shifting into a role akin to slave owner. That was the world they knew, and what a fucked up world they would recreate in Liberia. Now that I've broken down how Liberia was settled and by whom, and how the seeds for so much modern strife were sown, uh, let's learn some of the basics about the lay of the land. Liberia is composed primarily of four different geographical regions, starting with the coastal plains. These plains are about 350 miles long, Uh, extend up to about 25 miles inland. They're low and sandy with miles of beaches interspersed with bar-enclosed lagoons, mangrove swamps, and a few rocky promontories, the highest being Cape Mount, about 1,000 feet high in the northwest. Uh, Parallel to the coastal plains is a region of rolling hills, some 20 miles wide, with an average maximum elevation of about 300 feet. None of the hills rise more than about 500 feet in elevation. Uh, Behind the rolling hills, most of the country's interior is uh, a dissected plateau with scattered low mountains ranging from 600 to 1,000 feet, uh, a few over 2,000 feet, to the tallest being Mount Nimba, which is nearly 6,000 feet. And then there is the rainforest. Liberia's rainforest uh, used to be full of animals like monkeys, chimpanzees, small antelopes, pygmy hippopotamuses, and anteaters. However, many of these animals, along with the already threatened elephants, shorthorn buffalo called bush cows and leopards, uh, hunted greatly during uh, the civil wars for food and their populations, you know, greatly diminished and now currently recovering from endangered levels. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are also many reptiles, uh, including three types of crocodiles and at least eight different types of poisonous snakes, uh, including, this is intense, the world's only flying snake, the winged bush cobra. This shit is insane. Not super big, they never reach more than about five feet in length, but similar to the parachute-like membrane that stretches from the wrist to the ankle of the flying squirrel, uh, they have this membrane that lies on the outside of their scales, on either side of their bodies where their lungs are, and they can basically inflate this membrane and create these two little wings. Uh, Like the flying squirrel, they don't really fly, they glide, uh, and they glide from trees down to the ground, unlike the squirrel, which glides from one tree to another. Uh, they glide from trees that are surprisingly fast at climbing. They're fucking terrifying, uh, and that's how they attack. They slither up to the upper branches of a mangrove tree. They'll be 20, 30 feet up in the air, and then they silently glide down. They can glide up to over 100 feet away from the tree, and their prey typically never hears or sees them coming. And they kill an estimated 200 people a year in Liberia alone. They're extremely venomous. They're also found in over five other African nations. And and the venom from a winged bush cobra, before it kills you, it will make you hallucinate. Vivid hallucinations. It can make you hallucinate so hard, you will actually believe that all the bullshit I just made up about the winged bush cobra is true. Uh, Get the fuck out of here. uh, Snakes don't fly. Come on. They don't fly. They don't glide. Thank God. It'd be a monster. It'd be terrible to have to worry about flying fucking snakes out in the jungle. Uh, Back to reality. I need to break it up for a second. Uh, The climate, especially on the coast, is warm and humid year-round, dominated by a dry season from November to April and by a rainy season from May to October. I'm still thinking about the the flying bush, the winged bush cobra. (laughs) I'm picturing somebody who stopped listening to the episode uh, right before I said, get out of here. 
and they're telling a bunch of people right now, like, are you fucking, have you fucking heard of this fucking flying snake? Yeah, Liberia is a fucking flying cobra. Uh, the climate, anyway, warm and humid year round, dominated by a dry season from November to April, rainy season from May to October. In Monrovia, uh, the temperature varies between 74 and 88 degrees Fahrenheit year round, rarely dipping below 70 or rising above 91. Sounds ideal. It's one of the few ideal things about Liberia. Uh, the Liberian economy has uh, been since the early days of its settlement, predominantly agrarian. Uh, there's also a lot of shipping, a lot of shipping of goods in and out of Liberia. It actually has the second largest ship registry in the world. Foreign ships registering under a Liberian flag of convenience have made Liberia one of the world's foremost countries in registered shipping tonnage. Uh, raw materials, equipment, consumer goods are imported. Production for export is carried out on a large scale through foreign investment in rubber, forestry, and mining. Uh, despite all the shipping, Liberia, Liberia primarily, again, agricultural. Uh, the distribution of wealth is extremely uneven. The coastal districts receive a greater share of economic benefits than the hinterland, a.k.a. the interior, uh, after which the administrative centers are the next beneficiaries. Prior to recent civil wars, Liberia was among the leading producers of iron ore in the world, uh, has sizable iron ore reserves. Other minerals include diamonds, gold, lead, manganese, graphite, cyanite, uh, Barite. Now let's talk a little bit about the people of Liberia. Get to know more than just the American immigrants. Who were the natives the Americo-Liberians clashed with? Who their descendants still clash with? Uh, the people of Liberia are classified primarily into three major groups. The indigenous people, who are the, uh, the majority, and who migrated from uh, Western Sudan in the late Middle Ages. The second group, the descendants of black immigrants from the U.S., the Americo-Liberians we've been talking about, and lumped in with them are the descendants of former slaves from the West Indies. And then the third group is other black immigrants from neighboring Western African states, uh, many who came during the anti-slave trade campaign and European colonial rule. Uh, Liberia's indigenous ethnic groups may be classified into three linguistic groups, all belonging to the Niger-Congo language family, the Mandi, uh, Kwa, and Mel. Uh, Kwa-speaking people include the Basa, the largest group in this category and the largest ethnic group in Monrovia, uh, the Kru, the Gribo, uh, who are among the earliest converts to Christianity, the D, uh, the Bell, and the Crown, uh, Joshua Bly, Mr. Buttonaken himself, a member of the Crown people. So many different ethnic groups in Liberia. Uh, altogether, there are at least 17 different distinct indigenous cultures living in Liberia. And many of them don't get along with each other any better than they've gotten along with the Americo Liberians. These groups will all violently clash with one another for years during Liberia's civil wars. And I hope I'm pronouncing their names right. If not, apologies. Uh, very hard to find pronunciation guides or people saying, you know, any of these words on YouTube, especially in an American accent. Uh, about four-fifths of Liberians are Christian, about one-tenth are Muslim, and a small number profess other religions, primarily traditional beliefs or are non-religious. Uh, Demographic-wise, more than two-fifths of the population of Liberia is under age 15 and only 5% older than 60. How sad is that? There's been so much fucking murder, so much poverty and disease, only 5% of the population is over 60. Uh, for comparison, 16% of the U.S. population is over the age of 65. Uh, life expectancy in Liberia is about 57 years for males, 60 years for females. Uh, life expectancy fell dramatically as a result of the civil wars. In the U.S., the average life expectancy is 76 for dudes and 81 for dudettes. That's a lot more life, about 20 years more than in Liberia. Uh, what is life like in Liberia today for the average Liberian? Not good. In short, really not fucking good at all. Uh, roughly half of Liberians live in abject poverty. Not just poverty, abject poverty, which means they are severely deprived of basic needs like food, clean water, shelter, sanitation, and basic healthcare access. Uh, things have gotten a little better lately in some ways, but they're still fucking horrific. A uh, recent report shows that roughly 64.7% of Liberians are literate compared to 10 years ago when uh, only 42% of the population could read or write. Though the literacy rate has increased, the gender gap continues to highlight a lack of educational op opportunities for women. While 77% of Liberian men can read and write, only 54% of Liberian women currently are literate. Just basically half. Fucking 2020. Uh, poor living conditions in Liberia forced many families to send their children to work instead of school. As of 2018, 21% of children are engaged in child labor. That figure used to be much, much higher not that long ago. Uh, disease has ravaged and continues to ravage Liberia. 
The Ebola virus has killed more than 11,000 Liberians. And in 2016 alone, Ebola hit Liber uh, Liberia harder than almost anywhere else in the world. Uh, Liberia had 2,900 new HIV infections added to the already 43,000 people living with the disease. And that happened in 2016. Uh, and of the 43,000, only 19% able to access any kind of anti-retroviral anti treatment. Uh, thousands still die from malaria every year in Liberia. For comparison, about five people die each year from malaria in the U.S., a much bigger country population-wise. You know, with about, I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't put the stat in there, but Liberia, don't quote me on this. Uh, but just, uh, now I'm just pulling it from memory. I think about 4 million, 5 million people, uh, well over 300 million in the U S so that that's insane. If you really want to get a feel for how terrible life can be in Liberia, I recommend you watch a vice documentary from 2012 called the cannibal warlords of Liberia. Holy shit. Uh, just seeing it is so much more powerful, uh, than hearing it about, about it. At least it was for me. One of the most intense docs I've seen in a while, just under an hour long, uh, maybe don't watch it if you're already sad because it is a giant pit of misery and despair. According to this doc, Liberia, the fourth poorest country in the world in 2012, 50% uh, of the population illiterate, and one of the worst nations in the world for women. They state that at the time, an estimated 70% of adult women were believed to have been the victims of rape. Seven out of 10. It's fucking horrifying. Uh, at the time, 80% of the population was unemployed. Also, an unknown but thought to be sizable percentage of the population had tasted human flesh. Yes, cannibalism was big in Liberia during the wars. Uh, our mythical Kroll's Cafe would have sold very well there. It's believed that uh, ritual cannibalism is still practiced in many parts of Liberia. Uh, General Butt Naked apparently ate human flesh on a regular basis while fighting in the first of Liberia's two recent civil wars. Uh, one warlord, General Rambo, a uh, great warlord name, Talked about how during the Civil War in Monrovia, people would collect fallen bodies around town, push them on carts around town uh, to sell to starving citizens desperate for meat. Holy shit. Just a fucking dude pushing human bodies to sell for meat. And this didn't happen hundreds of years ago. The first Liberian War lasted from 1989 to 1997. The second began in 99, lasted until 2003. Recently, human beings walking down the street of a major city, pushing a cart full of human bodies Selling them for meat. Get your fresh neighbor. Fresh neighbor meat. We got neighbor ribs. We got neighbor arm steaks, leg steaks. You want that tasty neighbor butt? Bake it, grill it up, slice it, toss it on the frying pan. We got neighbor butts all day long. Boil your neighbor's head. Make a nice neighbor face meat soup. So much neighbor meat. It's fucking crazy. A Liberian journalist interviewed in the doc also talks about how uh, there are still dead bodies all over the place in certain neighborhoods. And oftentimes when you come across them, their genitals have already been cut off. Why? Uh, for good luck. Not kidding. He said that some dudes will cut off a woman's vulva and basically taxidermy it in some way to kind of flatten it, carry it around in a wallet and use it as a quote, source of power. He's saying this just eight years ago. Just dudes cutting off women's vulvas. Like it's fucking no big deal. Like it's normal. Just tanning them, throwing them in their wallets for, you know, a little extra oomph, a little extra power. Uh, based on the footage I saw in this doc from some of Monrovia's worst neighborhoods like West Point, I believe it when he says this. Uh, before I describe what the doc uh, showed going on in West Point, like the worst neighborhood in Monrovia, I should point out that not everywhere in Monrovia is this bad. There are decent neighborhoods full of actual law enforcement, paved clean streets, uh, toilets, thriving markets, just not enough of them. There are over 150 different neighborhoods uh, in the city of Monrovia, in a city of just over a million people total. And while not all of the neighborhoods are nightmares, unfortunately, many are some degree of nightmare. Check out this horrific stat again from 2012. Only a third of Monrovia's residents at that time had access to toilets. That means over half a million people just had to shit wherever they could, you know, find a place to shit. Just outside. Uh, this is in a city. The people in the dock talked about being overpowered by the smell of literal shit all the time. Uh, they show this huge beach in Monrovia where everyone just shits in the sand. So much shit. While they're filming, just people are just out there shitting. People are shitting in the streets. There's garbage in the streets. So much garbage sometimes they set fire to it just so that traffic can keep moving down the streets. The Monrovia slums in this documentary are preposterously dystopian. Like forget third world. This is like fourth or fifth world. It's hard to process how bad it is. I had to watch many parts twice. Uh, the journalists talked to and filmed kids openly smoking heroin, like little kids, like nine, 10 years old. 
Uh, kids talking to him about recently doing shit like robbing and raping some woman at gunpoint, just casually talking about that. It's just life. Uh, you see a kid singing in the street about everyone they know dying of AIDS. Uh, you meet kids, young kids talking casually about, you know, murder, about doing as much coke and heroin as they can. Kids with no living family members, no homes. Kids shitting in the street, sleeping out on the ground, doing whatever they feel like they have to do to survive. Uh, you see the saddest brothels you'll ever see uh, in West Point where young sex workers just do what whatever anyone wants to do for less than a single U.S. dollar. There's rooms in this West Point brothel that look like something out of Saw or some like hostile type horror film. Brothels with concrete walls, either no lights or just candles or maybe like a single light bulb swinging like an interrogation room from the ceiling. Tiny prison cell-like rooms with a concrete or dirt floor. One tiny window with iron bars across it. Literally blood on the walls. It looks like fucking hell on earth. It looks like the, the scene, like the setting of a horror movie. Uh, sex workers interviewed talk about being raped on a regular basis, about being beaten, how there's no other jobs for them, how they uh, they work as prostitutes just to get food to survive. Some of them spoke about how they have educations, how they have a, a trade of some kind. They used to have a different job, but now just this. Uh, they talk about UN soldiers who are supposed to be or were supposed to be at the time protecting them and improving life in Liberia, instead beating and raping them. Uh, they talk about witnessing UN soldiers having sex with young children. It's, it's fucking insanity. Uh, most of the sex workers are orphans. So many orphans in Liberia. So many people with no family, no job, no hope, nothing. Nothing good in their lives. They live in a city surrounded by a jungle full of warlords. There's no escaping this madness for many of them. Just death is always nearby. It's hell. Like they, they live in hell on earth, a dystopian nightmare. And, and, and what's really crazy as far as today's show goes, in this chaos, in this atmosphere of over-the-top violence and constant death, General Butt Naked still stands out. He was so ruthless and brutal. He stands out as one of the most feared butchers in a nation full of so much butchery. After watching this doc, despite admitting to committing so, so many atrocities that we'll get into later, despite committing to so many blatant war crimes, I do understand why General Butt Naked is still a free man. He's free because if you're going to arrest him, how many others must you also arrest? You would need to arrest thousands. He was born into a nation full of a silly amount of murderers. So much murder and rape. Therefore, it's a nation, you know, yeah, full of, you know, murders, rapists. Where do you even start cleaning that up? Would arresting General Butt Naked make a difference? Would it help anything? I'll talk about more of that. Uh, or talk, I'll talk more about this at length in the end, but man, so complicated. Uh, thankfully, things do seem to have gotten less violent since 2012. Liberia did not make a recent most dangerous nations in the world list compi compiled by global security and medical specialists from around the world. So that's, that's a step up. That's good. Uh, still not safe though. I don't recommend traveling there. Uh, the UK and many other nations, governments, and various travel advisory websites still state that while tourists aren't usually the targets of violence, at least not as often as locals are targets in Monrovia and elsewhere in Liberia, you should still be very careful, careful, and you should never travel anywhere at night. After sundown, uh, stay the fuck inside. Okay, now that we've laid out how terrible life can be in Liberia for many, let's talk about the men who maybe made life a little better there for some and definitely made life much worse for many. Uh, the warlords, General Butt Naked and his peers. Uh, while stories about modern warlords seem to center around Africa for the past few decades, warlords have actually been around since Meat Sacks started organizing themselves into societies. Uh, warlords are definitely not an African phenomenon. According to Merriam-Webster, a warlord is a supreme military leader or a military commander exercising civil power by force, usually in a limited area. They're local strongmen who operate in their locales and take control where there's a political vacuum. Instead of someone like a politician, uh, a warlord's power is characterized by being self-interested, out for their own wealth and power and the wealth and power of their small circle, people who avoid acquiring fixed assets that they have to guard and who fail to provide any public goods, uh, such as security, infrastructure, or education. So they're, they're kind of different than a politician. They're different than most. I feel like some politicians seem a little warlord-ish. Uh, warlords need militias to support them, so a good deal of their energy and violence goes towards keeping their militia satisfied. And sometimes that militia is made up of people who, who really can't split away without being in grave danger and who don't need a lot of food or resources like many of the children who fought for General Butt Naked. Warlords have exercised power across the globe and in a variety of different times. The feudal warlords of medieval Europe began as members of the landed nobility during the Carolingian Empire in the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries. We touched on that empire last week. As the empire gradually collapsed at the close of the first millennium, the social system of loyalty that characterized the old regime became less hierarchical, hierarchical 
and more fragmented, and the lords began to set separate policies for the administration of justice and taxation over the lands that they controlled. Warlords began to levy arbitrary taxes on jurisdictions that often overlapped. Gone was the central government in its place, a smattering of warlords ruling over a fluctuating landscape of boundaries over their little fiefdoms. Uh, Sounds terrible. Some warlordism in China occurred much more recently. It began after the fall of the Manchu Qing Empire in 1911, ending with the mainland victory of Mao's communist revolution in 1949. In 1911, the Qing-Mongol dynasty collapsed during a revolution led by provincial armies whose men were disgusted with the regime's inability to stave off the threat of foreign encroachment. The warlords who emerged in the aftermath were mostly former imperial military officers. Successful warlords were good politicians who wooed local economic elites to gain control over provincial and municipal tax collection. Since geographical boundaries dividing warlord areas of rule in China were often non-existent, the same warlord could sometimes act as a military governor on behalf of Beijing and at other times as an anti-Beijing insurgent. For example, warlords collected municipal taxes on territory they controlled by government decree, but they also would lead local tax revolts if it was to their personal advantage. In addition, they extorted unofficial taxes from illegal checkpoints, including along railroad lines. Sometimes they also forced residents to grow uh, opium poppies for them to sell or pay a laziness tax if they refused. Uh, Sounds confusing and terrible. Uh, In both Somalia and Afghanistan, warlordism uh, is a newer phenomenon. Civil war in both countries gave men who controlled weapons and militias the power to subvert and displace traditional clan or tribal authorities and take control. In Somalia, the military took over the country in a bloodless coup when the last functioning civilian president was assassinated in 1969. Major General Muhammad Sayyid uh, Barr became the new state ruler but he lost domestic legitimacy after an ill-fated military campaign against Ethiopia for control over the disputed Ogaden region in the late 1970s. He, reali- uh, he relied increasingly on support from his own clan and various sub-clan factions to retain power. Uh, Barr paid these clan members off from state coffers, packed government positions with his own people, and fomented, fomented uh, inter-clan rivalries to divide his opponents. As a result, the army fragmented into clan-based militias, each supporting its own interests with armaments left over from the competitive Soviet and U.S. assistant packages, assistance packages uh, that have been offered to Somalia in the past. Uh, why we see a lot of warlords in Africa today is because African governments often fail to provide public goods and services to the entire country. This is what happened in Liberia for sure. Various ethnicities had not been taken care of by the government that viewed them as second-class citizens for over a century. And when warlords came along and took resources, even if they kept most of those resources for themselves and only gave a little to everyone else, well, a little was better than the nothing people were previously receiving. I covered the info in in this following section and more in a suck I did in January of 2018, uh, the colonial devastation of Africa, suck number 72. Going to give a brief recap uh, of some of that info now because it's very relevant to today's suck. As we learned in that episode, The colonization of Africa really got going with the Berlin Conference that kicked off in 1884, when Otto von Bismarck decided the leaders of Europe needed to sit down and figure out how to carve up another continent to fuck over. Uh, By 1910, over 90% of Africa was under imperial control. Only Liberia and Ethiopia remained independent. Italy tried to take Ethiopia over in 1896, got his fucking ass kicked in the Battle of Adwa. The Italians would later kick Ethiopia's ass in 1936, ruled that nation for about five years before Ethiopia kicked them back the fuck out. Uh, Africans were forced to fight for for their colonial overlords in both World War I and World War II. So while the slave trade was abolished in the late 19th century, slavery in some form did continue in Africa until well into the 20th century. And before and after World War I, when economic recessions and depressions hit Europe, Europeans turned to Africa to rebuild their economies, to rebuild their fortunes. Europe's growing interest in Africa's minerals led to her expansion into the interior. The Great Depression that followed Europe was also affected by the stock market crash of 1929, uh, worse than the already failing economies of Europe. The mining of mineral wealth from Africa required the reorganization of colonial rule, which meant that the autonomy chiefs and kings in Africa had maintained over the years would be increasingly dissolved to make room for a more progressive form of government, a form that would send a, a, form that would send a shit ton of mining money back to European overlords. Uh, Land was taken away from African tribes and residents and chiefs and local empires and given to white settlers and colonial companies like the British South African Company for farming and for mining. 
parts of Africa are actually still being economically subjugated by former imperial imperial rulers. The French still tax the shit out of 14 African nations, 12 of which are former French colonies, to the tune of roughly $500 billion a year. Uh, too complicated to break down why they're taxing them here, uh, but basically it has to do with these nations still using French currency. It's also just a bunch of bullshit that benefits France far more than it benefits these African nations. Uh, European leaders carved Africa up with no regard for what kingdoms already existed or which tribes already lived there, where they lived, uh, which tribes got along with what other tribes. European colonialism did very little uh, with African natives to educate and empower them. Instead, they mostly just used them as cheap labor. And when it was no longer profitable to keep using them, they just left. And they left a big fucking mess that they largely created oftentimes. More than a quarter of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa poorer now than they were in 1960. And there is no sign that foreign aid, however substantive, will end that poverty anytime soon. Uh, aid doesn't help much without a solid infrastructure to receive and distribute it. In 2011, according to the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, official development aid to Liberia totaled $765 million, made up 73% of its gross national income, uh, some even larger in 2010, but it's not, it's not helping like it should. Last year, every one of the 25,000 students who took the exam to enter the University of Liberia failed. All of the aid is still failing to provide a decent education to Liberians. And without that decent education, you know, that means that, uh, you know, Liberia and similar African states will still be weak and plagued with corruption. Typically, weak states lack presence in their border regions and rural areas, which then become ungoverned spaces, spaces perfect for warlords to take over. Uh, and that's what has happened in Liberia. Without a monopoly over the use of force in rural areas and with the exclusion of certain groups from the political realm, African nations uh, become prone to insurgent groups in conflict. Warlords emerge. They have the opportunity to emerge when structure, authority, power, law, and other civil order fragments, leaving a political vacuum to be filled. And soon now we will dig into the life of one of the warlords who tried to fill that vacuum, General Butt Naked. Uh, before we learn a lot about his life in the timeline, uh, let's first take a look at the tribe Joshua Bly came from. The crown are, are found throughout Liberia. It's either the crown or crown. I heard it pronounced crown more often. Uh, though they primarily are found in Grand Guetta and Nimba counties, they are also found in Monrovia and elsewhere. And Bly is a member of the Sarpo, one of several ethnic groups within the Kron people or crown people. And the Sapro clan consists of six different subclans. Kabade, uh, Kimpa, uh, Kimupo, Putu, Sikan, Oh, I have no idea how to say some of these. And there's no guy. This is like smaller subclans. Uh, Warzon and Wedja? Guessing. Uh, Bly's parents were from Kabade, from that subclan, uh, the seat of an ancient god. They supposedly worship a god known as Nyagewea. Uh, and I say supposedly for reasons that we made clear later. Uh, when it comes to his tribal religion, hard to figure out how much of what uh, Bly is saying is real and how much he's making up. Uh, because Samuel Doe, the leader who would hold power in Liberia from 1980 through 1989 was also crowned. Many members of that ethnic group moved to Monrovia, the capital city, uh, during the 1980s, and General Butt Naked was one of them. Once in power, President Doe instituted a blatant patronage system, rewarding the crown, uh, a generally rural and agrarian people who only make up about 4% of the total Liberian population, with a disproportionate number of senior military and government positions. And often the jobs were high paying positions that didn't require the person holding it to really do much. Mostly they just got a cool title and a cooler paycheck, uh, the perfect gig. And gradually the crown were blamed by many Liberians for the brutality and corruption of the Doe years and for siphoning off the country's wealth. And this you know, tension will add fuel to the fire that will lead to the first Liberian civil war. Uh, couldn't find much on the crown people's traditional tribal practices other than what's in Bly's memoir. Uh, like I mentioned, not sure I, I believe a lot of what he says, but it's worth sharing because it's interesting and we get to know lies or not general butt naked a little bit better by telling this stuff. A uh, dude either had an extremely unusual childhood or is a con artist. He's a con artist with a fantastic imagination or some mix of the two. The way Bly describes it, every first male child in his tribe is trained as a warrior and must pass through numerous traditional practices. When a crowned child first turns eight, he's expected to contribute to his father's house. In return, his father doesn't make any major decisions without the boy's consent. He attends general tribal meetings, also fends for himself being considered a laughingstock if he eats from his mother's soup pot after he turns eight. That's what Bly says. Totally. Sounds legit. Uh, and how a boy should be raised, right? I mean, what, what kind of weak-ass mama's boy? 
Let's his mom still feed him when he's fucking eight years old. I was grilling steaks from various woodland creatures that I'd killed myself by the time I was six or seven. Like a normal, strong boy man. Uh, Bly says that the crown fathers teach their sons to hunt with guns and traps on land, to farm, fall trees, build fences, raise animals. All this with the belief that these things will make the firstborn boy mature enough to assume a priestly role. This priestly role thing comes up a lot. That's like the top position in your tribe. If you're the fucking priest, you're the fucking man. You're the top, top dog. All of the fathers do these things with their first sons in the hopes that they'll be selected for priesthood by Nyagiwa. And again, no idea how to say this. It doesn't really come up anywhere that I can find. Nyagewa, uh, the, crown, uh, the crown people's reigning deity. To avoid the stigma of having a weak or useless firstborn son, Bly says fathers will kill sons they see as not being fit for the job. And again, feels fair. I've never talked about him before, but my son Kyler used to have an older brother, Ricky Dean. That's my true firstborn son, old Ricky Dean. Uh, but I had to kill him. I had to. I caught that little worthless nine-year-old fuck asking his mom to make him mac and cheese and be given some apple juice to drink and to be taken to a doctor sometimes. And I was like, not on my watch, parasite! At nine and a half, he still didn't have an after-school job. I gave him an extra six months, you know, grace period. Nope. Still hadn't taken down a single elk with a knife he'd made himself by rubbing an antler or some shit against a stone edge until it was razor sharp. What was I supposed to do with that kid? Love him? Nurture him? Give his still-forming brain time to develop? (laughs) No thanks. Not a weak parent. I killed him and I made his younger brother Kyler eat him to absorb his strength and power. You get it. Uh, You don't get it, do you? I hope not. Uh, General Butt Naked would get it. Uh, That was savage nonsense. Uh, I hope that Buttnaked is making some of this shit up, but maybe not. According to Bly, his tribe would engage in battles with other tribes, and when they would win these battles, and they would win, right? Because his tribe is the best. He'd say that the uh, victorious crown would then make their defeated opponents agree to the following. These odd and repetitive declarations to nullify the spiritual control of the land's gods and turn it over to their own gods. One. Agree that the gods of our fathers that empowered us to conquer you shall have access into the hidden places of your gods. And even if you go there to take refuge, we are entitled to bring you back. Two, agree that the blood and water we used in conquering you and your land have nullified the blood and water you used in founding the land and its preservation. Three, agree that you will be our servants and everything that belongs to you by nature and achievement belongs to us. Four, Agree that our blood and water used in conquering you have nullified the blood and water that was used in getting your crops and livestock. Five, agree that our blood and water, they really like to say blood and water. Agree that our blood and water used in conquering you have nullified the blood and water that your parents used in burying you. Six, I bet you know how it's going to start. Agree that our blood and water used in conquering you have nullified the blood and water you used in burying your children now and unborn. And then one more, seven, agree that as of now, oh, change it up a little. Agree that as of now, you shall come under the gods of our fathers and it shall render you useless if the blood and water, there we go, from your body ever cease responding to us in the affirmative. Uh, The last declaration uh, gets a little meandering. I feel like it's a little repetitive and convoluted. Maybe it runs on too long, (laughs) right? What are they they even talking about now? Uh, Seven, agree that as of now and not of yesterday and not of two weeks ago, blood and water, uh, last year or more years ago, you are under our God's blood and water and not your God's or any other God's blood and water, but God's and you shall get to rendering blood and water God's and whoever is rendered is thusly no longer of old ways, blood and water, uh, but your blood and water and blood and some extra water and henceforth hitherto has agreed to be ours forever blood and ever water. And if not a good place when can respond to affirmative and blood and, and if non affirmative water affirmative. Uh, okay. Sure, I agree. Uh, Bly claims this is how he was raised. In a tradition where there's no room for weakness, where firstborn boys are the only kind of kids really cared about, and uh, even they are killed for being soft, where you conquer someone totally, you take everything from the defeated, their achievements, their crops, their livestock, their their body, their blood, their soul. All of this might be bullshit. Uh, We'll look into soon uh, how a lot of expert cultural anthropologists doubt anything like the rituals Joshua describes ever took place. Uh, Keep in mind that as as we move through the timeline, a lot of our information about Joshua Bly's childhood does only come from his memoir, The Redemption of an African Warlord, The Joshua Bly Story. While parts of it are probably true, as we'll see later, Bly... He makes a lot of crazy claims. He he claims, you know, that, that God speaks to him numerous times. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Tina Sussman, among the first Western journalists to write about Bly after his conversion to Christianity, told The New Yorker, I've covered a lot of warlords. After a war is over, they have to reinvent themselves. That's how they survive. 
that's what Joshua claims to do in his book to have, uh, you know, had this big conversion. Is is that what he's doing just to survive? I don't know. If the war, you know, was still ongoing after he converted, would, would General Butt Naked return to battle as ruthless as ever? Maybe. Uh, let, let's meet him. Let's meet him and see what you think. Time for this week's Time Suck Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck Timeline. This is my favorite part of the episode, this, this timeline. Uh, we already went over the founding of Liberia, so uh, no need to go over all that 19th century century stuff again here. Uh, picking things up in the early 20th century uh, with the tire company, randomly. In 1926, the Firestone Tire and Rubber Co. Uh, created the world's largest plantation at Harbor, Liberia, and rubber became the backbone of the Liberian economy. Firestone had signed a 99-year concession agreement with the Liberian government in the 1920s to grow and export rubber, and thousands of indigenous Liberians will be exploited mercilessly by Firestone and the Liberian government. And this exploitation will, over 60 years, push the nation towards civil war. Harvey S. Firestone Sr., the Ohio-born founder of the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company, had become one of the top industrialists of the Gilded Age. He dreamed of finding a rubber source beyond the grasp of the British Empire, which controlled much of the world market at the time. In Liberia, he found a spot in the narrow band around the equator where rubber trees thrived and a nation that was in debt and desperate for business. After two years of negotiations, Firestone and Liberia announced one of the one of history's really greatest sweetheart deals. Uh, Liberia gave Firestone the right to lease up to a million acres, roughly 10% of the country's arable land for six cents an acre for 99 years. Uh, Liberia made a very shitty deal here. And the Americo Liberians running Liberia to make some extra money off of this deal seem to have sold locals into essentially plantation slavery and forced them to work for Firestone during the 20th century. In 1930, investigators from the League of Nations found that officials in the Liberian government had engaged in forcing indigenous villagers to work on private farms, including Firestone's giant plantation. Uh, they did not find evidence that Firestone was complicit in this, and the rubber plantation exploitation continued. Uh, 1943, William Tubman is elected president of Liberia. He promotes foreign investment and local participation in government. During his long tenure, Liberia will experience a period of prosperity for some. Uh, by the time of his death in 1971, Liberia had the largest mercantile fleet in the world, the world's largest rubber industry, and was the third largest exporter of iron ore in the world. Uh, they attracted more than a billion dollars in foreign investments. During the 1950s, Liberia had the second highest rate of economic growth in the world. Also during the 1950s, Firestone and others in Liberia continued to fuck over Liberia's poorest people. Uh, Firestone was Liberia's largest private employer and the largest exporter in the country during that decade. And Firestone's profits after taxes amounted to three times the government's total revenue for all of Liberia in 1951. And how is all this growth and these crazy profits possible? Well, because they were exploiting the fuck out of, uh, you know, the indigenous classes of Liberian society, the natives, people who were not descended from settlers, people who were not the Americo Liberians. Uh, also during the 1950s, Liberia became for all intents and purposes, a dictatorship. After a gunman attempted to assassinate Tubman in 1955, he brutally repressed uh, political opposition. This so-called assassination attempt widely believed to have been staged by Tubman in order to consolidate his power and in order to uh, squash his political enemies. His administration had become increasingly authoritarian before the assassination attempt. Liberia's constitution did not have term limits and Tubman did not ever volunteer to leave office. He controlled the dominant political party and created a wide network of you know, sycophants uh, through patronage appointments, giving away more jobs to people, jobs that didn't really require them to do anything other than be loyal to him. Cool titles, cooler paychecks. He's doing some warlord shit. On July 23rd, 1971, President Tubman dies. Vice President William Tolbert takes office. Uh, Tubman had ran the show for 27 years, you know, turned Liberia into a dictatorship. When Tolbert took over, he'd already been vice president for 19 years. And Tolbert was a member of one of the most influential and affluent Americo Liberian families. He tried to institute some reforms, and this backfired on him. He promoted a program to bring more indigenous people into the Liberian government, but local tribes didn't feel like it was enough. And at the same time, Americo Liberians staunchly opposed to this reform. They thought he was doing too much. He was accused of, according to one source, letting the peasants into the kitchen. So he quickly makes enemies on both sides. September 30th, 1971, Joshua Bly, 
the future, the future General Butt Naked is born. His last name, Bly, comes from his grandfather, who is simply called Bly. We're going to dive into uh, Bly for a while now before we return to the rest of this timeline. Uh, Bly marries Joshua's grandmother, Trefani, and has three children, Queti, Joshua's dad, and two girls, uh, followed by another boy. As was tradition for their tribe, Queti trained as the first son. You know, so he has to be doing some man shit by the age of eight, unless he wants to get killed. Uh, according to Joshua's memoirs, his father was a tough dude, won some sort of prize as a child for being his tribe's best hunter, uh, once rescued a cousin from a leopard. If that leopard story is true, that is pretty impressive. I haven't saved anyone from any kind of animal, not even from like a, like a raccoon or even a squirrel, let alone a leopard. I'm uh, not sure you can save anyone from a squirrel, actually. That'd be a tough tale to really sell, you know? Uh, wait, what was that you just said? You just said, that you, what? You saved your cousin from a squirrel? I don't understand how that's even possible. Well, hold on. Let me, okay, let me explain. See, when, when I fired that slingshot, that squirrel was probably, I don't know, five, maybe just six feet away from him. Actually, you know, actually, I think it was a little bit closer. It had to be because he was feeding it some bread. Wait, what? He was feeding the squirrel. If he, if he was feeding it, then, then why did he need to be saved from it? Listen, okay, hold on. Saved might not be the best word. I'm not positive that the squirrel was trying to kill him or, or really, you know, hurt him, bite him or anything. But I, I was worried that the squirrel was going to maybe take more bread from him than he wanted to give. And that's not cool. So I guess I saved the bread from the squirrel. I saved my cousin from losing more bread. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, take off. Uh, when one of his tribe's priests died, Joshua's father, Queti, was established as an interim priest. Queti lived and worked in Monrova, Monrovia, but traveled back to his homeland to bless crops, perform rites, offer various cures. Uh, at some point, Queti marries Ma Saiba, a Lorma woman from Lofa country in the northern part of Liberia. And again, according to Mr. Buttnaked, uh, Lofians have their own traditional and cultural practices, primarily within the poor and sandy secret societies, which are widespread through eastern Liberia and Sierra Leone. And Ma Saba, part of the Sandy Society, had, had a very high rank. So she's seen as kind of magical. Magic uh, is big in, this, uh, big in these tribes. Uh, Ma Saba gives birth to a boy, a child named Benedict, who will be instructed as all first sons are within the Sapro tribe. However, when Bly's dad, Queti, takes Benedict to elders to be introduced to their god, Naya, uh, Naya Gewe, the oracle rejects him. In Bly's words, the oracle says Benedict was from a mixed culture and already had the mark of the other culture. In frustration, the god Nagewe placed a curse of inconsistency upon the innocent child, which is to this day affecting his life. That's a very weird curse. I place a curse of inconsistency upon you. And then like sometimes your life is fine. And every once in a while you like you fucking trip or something like, ah, damn curse. Uh, the elders apparently didn't want a child who wasn't entirely sapro. So they decided to arrange a marriage now between Queti. Joseph, Joshua's dad and the woman and a woman they found suitable, a crown woman. They choose Elizabeth Panto, who was crown, but who was also already married with two children named Nelson and Harrison. Uh, Elizabeth will be Joshua's mother. She was a woman of high repute, and her father, uh, Nipan, was considered a very powerful man. This is super weird, what I'm about to say here. According to Bly, Nipan's father, who was also named Nipan, had, quote, traditional powers that he inherited from a source I cannot perfectly explain but he specialized in treating barrenness. The condition was such that a woman who first bear him a child, or I'm sorry, the condition was such that a woman would first bear him a child who remained with him when she returned to her father's or her husband's house. This explains why the name Nipan is such a common name among the Sapro. Uh, does everyone uh, follow what I'm saying here? What Joshua is saying here? He's saying that his maternal great-grandfather was a man with magical powers, and his magical powers were to cure infertility uh, by fucking various village women until they were pregnant and had a child. So I, I don't know that that's magic. Pretty sure that uh, has, has more to do with high sperm count than magic. What a sweet gig. Dr. Dick. Any hot village ladies having fertility problems? Dr. Dick is on the case. Any unattractive women having fertility problems? Uh, Dr. Dick will be happy to refer you to a rival dick doctor. Uh, one of the elders apparently observed that Joshua's father, Queti, uh, his passion for women was weak. So they assigned him his paternal uncle, Twela Fali, to cast a spell on Queti, okay, uh, to create a sudden burning desire for Joshua's mother. And then that worked out. But then, you know, she's she's still married. Uh, he's still married as well. Uh, Queti reassures his wife, Masaba, that as soon as Elizabeth Panto produces a suitable son, you know, their marriage will be terminated. And this is written in this weird way of like, 
listen, I know this seems kind of crazy that he's just going to leave one wife to go to this other wife, but he made things right by assuring her that once this second wife produces a son for him, you know, then, then she doesn't have to be married to him anymore. Very different culture we're dealing with here. Uh, that shit would not fly in America. If you're like, baby, I've met another woman and I'm going to marry her, but don't worry, I'm going to make it right. As soon as she's pregnant, you can leave. So, you know, everyone wins or something. Uh, and the baby Quetty would have with Elizabeth will be Joshua Bly, a.k.a. General Butt Naked. And, and again, according to Bly, he is, <laughs> this is insane. He says he's born weighing 18 pounds. He says he's the heaviest baby ever born at St. Joshua's Catholic Church in Monrovia. Get the fuck out of here. Highly unlikely. Even 13, 13 pound babies make the news. The heaviest healthy baby ever born was 22 pounds and eight ounces. Born in Italy in 1955. There's a few other cases in recorded history of babies over 20 pounds being born. Like three. After that, it drops off to like 16 pound babies. Bly is never mentioned in any big baby articles. Uh, Bly's parents' marriage is dissolved a few years later, probably by the priest again. A lot of marriages get moved around. And at the age of four, or the elders, excuse me, at the age of four, Joshua goes to live with his dad and stepmom. Uh, he goes to St. Peter's School in Monrovia, claims that when he's in first grade, he could solve math problems that fourth graders couldn't because he's super smart. You will uh, soon see that Mr. Butt Naked has no shortage of confidence, very high opinion of himself. I don't know that th this happened. As a child, Joshua says he had dreams about blood and hurting his friends. Sometimes he would hurt them. And then confusingly, his dad would scold him in front of the people he'd hurt, uh, give the victims money in private. So he must've hurt him pretty bad. But then, uh, you know, or I'm sorry, give the victims money in public. But then in private later, Joshua's dad would praise him and tell him he was pleasing the gods. Now he was strong. And sometimes strong man boys have to hurt people. If that is true, no wonder he became a warlord. I'm guessing I would have turned out a little differently growing up if my dad would have been like, you know, make me proud, son. Let's go hurt some kids today. Fuck them up. Joshua's father and stepmom arranged the birth of another child, Victor. And then Victor, when he's presented to the elders to be a priest for some reasons, well, everyone's getting fucking presented to the priests or the elders to be a priest. Uh, they reject him saying that they will only have the chosen one, AKA Joshua. So now he's the chosen one, according to his own memoir. Uh, apparently, Quetty liked Joshua so much. His dad liked him so much. He didn't want to hand him over to be a priest. Uh, a little confusing. Sorry if all of this is a little confusing. <laughs> again, again, all of this is based on Joshua's memoirs, and he is not the chosen author. He is not a gifted author. Uh, here's some more shit he wrote that's a little crazy, but amuses me. He says when he was in the third grade, he suffered from an illness that deformed him and made him look like an ape. Okay, sounds legit. Uh, he looks nothing like an ape now, but uh, you know, uh, it's not like that means the story is nonsense. I mean, he probably just found the right priest found some priests who specialized in ape reversal transformation spells. Uh, that has to be it. Joshua's dad took him from one doctor to another to cure his ape shape situation, and they would either refuse or they couldn't cure him. <laughs> I don't know why they would refuse. I could cure him, but I will not. Because <laughs> nothing makes sense here. Uh, his stepmom decides to take him to a witch to, to help him out, a witch named Zogboa, who says Joshua is born with a destiny that cannot be destroyed by any mortal being. Uh, no word on whether or not this witch unaped him. Just, you know, just more chosen one shit here. Uh, Joshua continues to be sick for the next four years uh, until apparently the god Nigewe visits Joshua's dad at work. <laughs> I like how this guy, this guy just shows up places like, like, like his dad just, you know, like at the shop or whatever, I don't know, whatever he's doing. And all of a sudden like in walks this, the village god. Hey, I'm village god. I want word, can I have a word with you about your son? Uh, everyone else in the office falls into a deep sleep, except Queti, uh, when this happens. And then the god Nigeawe berates him for not turning Joshua over to the elders, right? So he's at work, fucking guy walks in, makes everybody else fall asleep, and he's like, ah, give me your son, you selfish son of a bitch. And then Queti agrees to do so, handing over Joshua to the tribe's warriors, muscular men with spears and daggers in their hands that salute him, and then they take him into the forest with the parade <laughs> uh, following them. Uh, they leave him with the elders who bathe him, who tell him that the god Nigeaway is waiting for him. Before the break of dawn, they put him in a leather loincloth, put pieces of leather on his left arm and right wrist. They hang a bag of chalk on his shoulder and lead him to the town square for the ordination ceremony. The town square is crowded with men and women, you know, cheering for him. Yay, new priest guy. Uh, Joshua makes his way to the elders box. As he says it, uh, he entered the thick and heavy presence then of Nigeaway and could barely walk upright. His eyes became dim, and everything around him was blurry. They must have gave him some good shit. Uh, and then suddenly his ears opened to the spirit world, and he hears strange laughter, 
And here's where things, if they're not weird enough already, here's where things get real weird. He says a domineering voice commands him to lick the chalk from the bag for strength. He then arrives at a big rock, Nagaeway's throne at night. He stands there for three days and nights with only the chalk for food, waiting for this god. At midnight on the third day, he sees a stool appear and a strange voice directs him to stand on it. When he does, he gets sucked down inside the rock and he meets Nagaeue. And according to Joshua, Nagaeue is 12 feet tall. He's wearing old rags covered in mud, because why not? He has bruises on his left arm and his left wing is folded under his arm. Don't worry about those details. They don't come up again. He puts his hand on Joshua's shoulder and he points at what looks like a screen. And on this magic screen, Joshua sees various images from his childhood. Lots of images, days worth of images. On the first day, he watches scenes from his first year of life. On the second day, he watches scenes from his second year of life and so on. He's 11 years old, so fucking 11 days of this shit. He's down in that rock for a long time. I hope he brought enough chalk to eat. Uh, each scene reveals a wide shadow spread over Joshua and his mom uh, wherever there's a, whenever there's a, an attempt to harm them. Nagaewe explains every moment from Joshua's life to him and reveals that he is the shadow protecting Joshua all the time. According to Joshua, he told him, yes, I have been the one protecting you all along because you are my hero. You shall be the greatest in your time and admired by all. No human being can stand up to you or equal the status you shall attain as my priest. Men shall hold you in high regard. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. No shortage of ego on Joshua Bly. His God is telling him that he is God's hero. Man, dude, you got to tone down your vision. Painfully clear here that he did not use an editor for his memoirs, right? He should have had someone or someone who wasn't afraid of him, you know, maybe give it a little proofread. Maybe, uh, maybe ask like, are you sure uh, that God told you that you were God's hero? Uh, I don't know. I was just thinking maybe you might want to, you know, tone that down. Some people might make fun of you. Maybe some sarcastic podcaster might really mock you for doing something that unbelievable. Uh, back to the vision that no part of me actually believes happened, uh, but I do find entertaining. Joshua, <laughs> Joshua wrote on the 11th day that Nigeaway told him how to maintain the powers and responsibilities of being a priest. He told him, first, I want you to know that whatever transpires between you and me is highly confidential. If you reveal what transpires between you and me to others, you will expose the source of your powers. Be informed that these powers belong to you and the entire tribe before and after you. Any act of treason shall result in death. Ah, uh, dude, pretty sure that you writing all this down in your memoirs counts as, you know, transpiring this, this stuff, the revealing what, what transpired. Lucky to be alive, Joshua. Uh, and then he says that this God, a gateway, tells him, you will not eat or have anything to do with cola nuts. Touching, not to mention eating cola nuts, is tantamount to playing with the covenant I made with the tribe because cola nuts were the bane of the covenant. Uh, didn't expect this uh, to go in a cola nut direction. It's getting even weirder. Cool fact about cola nuts, actually, by the way. Let's take a little break from this insanity and talk about something real. Uh, they come from the cola tree. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, that's not the cool part. Uh, they, they are the fruit of the cola tree, a tree found in African rainforests. And this cool fact about them is that Coca-Cola is partially named after these nuts. Like the coffee berry and the tea leaf, they contain, uh, they can, they contain caffeine. And in the 1880s, John Pemberton, a pharmacist in Georgia, took caffeine extracted from cola nuts and cocaine containing ex extracts from coca leaves, mixed that with sugar, some other flavorings, carbonated water, bingo bango, he invents Coca-Cola, the first cola soft drink. One more piece of trivia about this cola nut. Coca-Cola took it out of the recipe in 2016. So if you thought it started to taste different a couple years back, now you're right. Uh, back to Joshua's very real vision now that for sure happened. Uh, next, his God, Nigeaway, tells him, since you are very young for the power you are about to use, you must make human sacrifices. This is the real reason I wanted to lay all this out. Because this is, you know, the, the rationalization he'll use for, for future sacrifices for, the, for his, his warlording. He says, you must make human sacrifices on a monthly basis at the appearing of the new moon. These will enable you to retain the powers you receive. Failure or delay from your quarter shall result in your demise. Interesting. Now, instead of eating cola nuts to pep up, he has to eat people every month. It's a bummer. It's so much easier to eat cola nuts. Uh, Bly, and again, Bly will point to this vision for the rest of his life as to why he had to kill all those kids. God told him to. He needed the magic. Now, Gayaway then instructed him to swallow some cowrie shells or cowrie shells. These shells come from sea snails, and they were once used as a form of currency in Africa and certain parts of Asia. And the cowrie shells Joshua swallowed apparently served as remote controls to 11 different powers. The two in his right hand would, con would contact the supernatural knife and the stool of authority. I, f I find that very odd, the stool of authority. But, uh, the three in his left hand were for disappearing and reappearing. Okay. 
Two in his left thigh were for protection from bullets and knives. One in his right was for hypnotizing and invoking spirits. And this is my fav- favorite part from his memoirs. And then the last two, Joshua, he doesn't, he doesn't really know what they are. I like how he makes up all these details. <laughs> and some of them are not great, you know? Uh, and then he just gives up on the last two shells. I don't, I don't know. Maybe he didn't make all this up. Maybe he really believes all this stuff happened. Maybe he had some kind of hallucination, some kind of fever dream. It's not impossible. I mean, he is crazy. As you'll see later, this dude is for sure fucking crazy. Uh, the Nigewe then resurfaces. Uh, Joshua, you know, back to his village, sends him uh, up there. The, there, the elders announce his return. And then he enters the elders' huts and apparently he starts uh, giving instructions as far as how the tribe should be led. Now, he's the big priest. And all this happens supposedly when he's 11 years old. He's running shit now. Joshua writes that he spends another six or seven days with the elders before his father takes him back to Monrovia. And in Monrovia, Nigewe continues to visit Joshua between midnight and four in the morning via soul trips on ab- abstract planes. Sweet. Look, I haven't gone on a ton of soul trips, but I will say that the soul trips I've taken on abstract planes have definitely been my favorite, right? Like way better than the soul trips I've taken on, you know, concrete, real, non-abstract planes. Uh, what about the sacrifice thing? Now, Gateway told him to do. He says he gets to it right away. In Joshua's words, initially, my monthly human sacrifice was taken from Kotati's yard where I was brought up. Interesting that he just, you know, take kids from the yard. However, my conscience was greatly troubled after each sacrifice. When I heard the victim's parents weep for their loved ones, I decided to go far away to find my prey. However, if I did not succeed in securing a faraway victim on time, I resorted to offering any of the close residents. So he's, he's a serial killer. Uh, this part, sadly, I'm more inclined to believe than his crazy colonut PowerShell vision shit. Uh, he seems to have definitely killed and eaten a lot of children before he was a warlord. I do feel like he was probably, you know, just a straight up serial killer. This all fits right into his wheelhouse. Uh, he also said he started performing blind witch recruitments around this time by going to community wells and planting charms in them. So anyone who drank the water would become a medium to display his craft. What does all that mean? I have no fucking idea. (laughs) I think it means he's building a little army of followers by putting magic into the well. He says so much crazy shit, it's hard to make sense of all of it. Uh, And he sold charms as well. Uh, Can't forget to mention the sweet charms he sold. Uh, So can anyone corroborate all these claims? Uh, No, not that I know of. At least one family member of his has spoken up and said that a lot of it is bullshit, though. According to one of Bly's half-brothers, his authority in the community, maybe not quite what he claimed. Harrison Shine Chawler, uh, this half-brother in question, told a New Yorker profiler that he had been unaware of Bly's life as a priest. As far as Chawler knew, Bly was just a rebellious youth. He said their mom would give him money to buy food for the family, and instead of going shopping, he would disappear into the streets of Monrovia for weeks at a time. According to Chawler, Bly left school after the third grade, and this, I love this detail. And then later, sold Kool-Aid and chicken soup at a local market, wearing a purple necktie, purple shirt, purple trousers, and purple shoes, so he would stand out and people would recognize him. Slightly different version of his childhood here. <laughs> he was either a powerful priest who was God's own hero, a man destined to be the most powerful man in his lifetime, who started running his village at the age of 11, or he was a kid wearing a purple outfit at the grocery store selling Kool-Aid. I laughed so fucking hard when I first read that. This guy's so full of shit. Uh, Chawler said that Bly then moved on to drug trafficking and robbery. Sometimes Chawler said he and Bly would work together. Uh, Joshua did seem to be into witch powers when he was a kid. He, he at least, uh, you know, pretended that he knew them. According to Chawler, a Nigerian soldier once asked young Bly to help him gain spiritual powers. And Bly prescri- prescribed a witchcraft treatment, which was an enema, for whatever reason. And while the soldier was getting his enema, while Bly was, you know, pouring some, some witch juice up his ass, uh, Chawler stole his money and ran off. And Chawler wasn't the only person who doubts a lot of Joshua's claims. A David Brown, a social anthropologist who has worked in Liberia since the 1970s, said that he had never heard of a secret society that matches Bly's description. Many other experts have agreed. One called Bly's story uh, about the priest and the vision and all that stuff, uh, quote, ludicrous. Okay, let's back up now to 1979. We'll reconnect with Butt Naked, the bullshit artist, in a bit, and we'll go over some stuff he sadly definitely did. Uh, On April 14th, 1979, Liberia's rice riots began. A proposed increase in the price of imported rice suggested in order to stimulate local growth results in riots, which lead to many deaths and enormous infrastructural damage to the capital city of Monrovia. Uh, Liberian police shoot and kill 41 protesters on the 14th. More than 400 others are injured and the riots will cost over $35 million in damage. 
or will cause. Uh, President Tolbert, the day after the shootings, characterized the leaders of the demonstration as wicked, evil, and satanic men who wanted to bring chaos and disorder in the country with the eventual objective of overthrowing the government. These wicked men he's talking about are indigenous. Uh, the people killed by uh, you know law enforcement also indigenous, killed by you know people working on behalf of the Americo Liberian government. That's important, right? Uh, more seeds of discontent are sown. A revolution is brewing. A year later, almost to the day on April 12, 1980, Master Sergeant Samuel K. Doe of the Crown Tribe stages a coup against the Liberian government. Doe, a man with no prior political experience, but a ton of military experience, and a few of his soldiers kill President William Tolbert and 26 of his supporters. There are conflicting accounts regarding Tolbert's death. Most seem to suggest he was shot while still in his bed. A week later, Doe and his men publicly execute 13 of uh, the former ministers of government for treason. These men were walked nude through the streets of Monrovia, then shot by a firing squad on the beach. Hundreds of other government officials flee the country. Yeah, I bet. I'd be getting the fuck out of there too if I thought there was a chance they were going to drag my naked ass to the streets and shoot me on the beach. Doe is a very interesting character. Uh, it seems as though his coup was backed by the CIA, that the U.S. helped him kill Tolbert. Why would America do that? Well, because Tolbert was friendly with the USSR, the Soviet Union. Doe was a big fan of capitalism. In August 2008, before a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Monrovia, Doe's former justice minister alleged that the CIA uh, provided a map of the executive mansion to, to, you know, to help out with his coup, enabled Doe and other rebels to break into it, and that actually a white American CIA agent was the one who shot and killed President Tolbert. He said that the Americans were responsible for Liberia's nightmare, and I absolutely believe this. This happened during the Cold War, when the CIA was for sure toppling regimes with communist leanings or connections, and they were for sure replacing you know, the, the leaders in these nations with U.S.-friendly puppet regimes. Once the Doe puppet regime takes over, Doe proclaims himself the chairman of the People's Redemption Council and immediately severs diplomatic ties Liberia has with the Soviet Union. And he gets real friendly with the U.S. and the U.S. military. Uh, of course he does. He basically works for the U.S. government. Uh, he's a fucking stooge. Uh, he agrees to a modification uh, of a mutual defense pact Liberia has with the U.S., grants the U.S. military staging rights on 24-hour notice at Liberia's sea and airports for the U.S. Rapid Deployment Forces, established to respond quickly to security threats worldwide. Backed by the U.S., Doe becomes a brutal dictator. Uh, he soon does shit like shut down newspapers, bans political activity. At one point, he imposes a 6 p.m. curfew, uh, giving his soldiers the authority to kill anyone out in public after 6 p.m. He's also the first native head of state in the country's history. Uh, Samuel Doe will hold dictor dictate, <laughs> dictat ah, I can't even say this word. Dictator, dictatorial. Some of these words, are, I mean, you read them and you're like, nah, it's fucking, yeah, it's that word. I've seen that word a bunch of times. I know what it means. And then you go to say it. And then at least for me, my brain's like, nope. Ha ha ha. Good luck, you son of a bitch. Uh, Samuel Dole will hold dictatorial power, I think, in Liberia for nine years. And this, uh, uh, you know, and then his reign will end very, very badly. Five years later, 1985, Liberia has an election, in theory. Wanting to appear as an elected official and not as a totalitarian dictator who, you know, got into power by staging a coup, because uh, it's hard to maintain U.S. support, at least publicly, if you're a tyrannical despot, Samuel Doe runs for the office he essentially already holds against Jackson Doe. Uh, same last name, not related. And he becomes Liberia's 20th president. Because he wins, but maybe not. Doe claims victory under a huge cloud of controversy and widespread charges of vote rigging. I don't want to get into a lot of the details here, but it appears that he for sure rigged this election. Uh, Doe had the ballots taken to a secret location, had 50 of his own men count them. Convenient. Uh, foreign observers were not allowed to witness this count. Uh, there were all kinds of other crazy allegations like, uh, you know, people saw his soldiers and then the family of his soldiers just vote for him over and over at voting booths. Just blatantly. They just vote for him. Let's go back to the back of the line. Fucking come back, vote for him again. Just over and over and over. Uh, foreign observers think that Jackson Doe won in the landslide, actually. Despite these troubling allegations, the United States accepts the results of the election, offers support to President Doe. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if the CIA helped rig the election for him. Uh, General Butt Naked, interestingly, will later claim that he won the election for Doe. Of course he claims this. The world's most important man claims that he, quote, manipulated almost the whole nation to vote for him. I planted blind agents in all major restaurants and bakeries to sell his fame. Totally. That sounds very legit. 
If you want to win an election for someone, anyone who's anyone knows that you need to plant blind agents in restaurants and bakeries to sell their fame. <laughs> That's election winning 101. You know, the thing I hate the most about elections here in the U.S. is getting hassled by these fucking goddamn fame sellers at bakeries every four years. Every four years, it's the same shit. I walk in to grab a blueberry muffin, maybe a scone, and then there's some motherfucker in the corner just yelling shit like, Trump's super famous and cool. Celebrity Apprentice was popular, super famous. Vote for him. And then some other motherfucker across the bakery is like, no, Biden's super cool. He's been a politician since 1917. He has over 20 million followers on Twitter. He's been on Ellen. He's on The Tonight Show a bunch of times. Very famous. He got vote for him. And I'm like, God damn it, you blind agents. Stop selling fame. I'm trying to eat my scone. November, 1985. <laughs> Thomas Quicompa, Doe's former second in command, is killed when he attempts to overthrow Doe's government. This coup attempt leads to government-led violence against the Geo and Mono people of Quin uh, uh, Quicompa's native Nimba County. Uh, not good. Civil War now brewing. December 24th, 1989, the National Patriotic Front of Liberia, the NPFL, very different than the NFL, enters Liberia and kickstarts the first Liberian civil war. Let me give you a quick rundown on who's fighting who in this war. It's super confusing. <laughs> if you can't remember all these names, don't even worry about it. You just need to get the gist. The NFPL, the group that kicks shit off, is a band of Libyan trained military rebels led by one Charles Taylor. We're going to get to know him a little bit in this timeline. Very interesting dude. Uh, they invade Liberia from the Ivory Coast. Taylor had previously backed Doe's coup. And after it was successful, he was appointed director general of the General Services Agency. And his new job was to oversee government purchases. He was put in charge of a lot of money and he put a lot of that money into his pocket. He got caught embezzling roughly a million dollars into foreign accounts for himself. And then he fled to the US where he was arrested. And again, this guy's story, so interesting. This Charles Taylor, his, his life story is a Hollywood blockbuster just waiting to be filmed. After getting arrested in the U.S., he ends up in jail in Massachusetts. He's detained in the U.S. at the Plymouth County Correctional Facility awaiting a possible extradition back to Liberia. Then he breaks the fuck out of jail. September 15th, 1985, Taylor and four other inmates escape. Two days later, the Boston Globe reports that they sawed through a bar covering a window in a dormitory room, after which they lower themselves 20 feet on knotted sheets, escape into the nearby woods after climbing a fence. Then... Taylor and two other escapees are met at, at nearby Jordan Hospital by Taylor's wife and sister-in-law, who drives a getaway car to Staten Island, and then Taylor disappears. And, and, and his fellow escapees, as well as his wife and sister-in-law, they're apprehended. But not Taylor. He just ghosts everyone. He makes it out of the U.S., makes it all the way to Libya, where he meets up with Libyan socialist leader uh, Muammar Gaddafi, becomes Gaddafi's protege, receives a ton of military training, learns how to be a warlord, how to be a dictator. Years later in 2009, Taylor will claim at another trial that the CIA helped him escape from jail. And the CIA did confirm that Taylor was working with the U.S. intelligence at this time. Did they introduce him to Gaddafi as well? How deep does all that shit go? Crazy. Taylor's rebel group, the NFPL, consists mostly of Geo and Mono peoples from Eastern Liberia. Uh, the Geo and Mono people had long been opposed and persecuted by Liberian President Samuel Doe. The NPFL, largely made up of former Liberian military men, and it was one of the first Liberian military regimes to actively recruit child soldiers. The NPFL goes on to clash with government forces and other ethnic militias all the way until mid-1993. During three and a half years of fighting, all groups involved generated civilian casualties, but Taylor's NFPL seems to have generated the most. They were responsible for the slaughter of thousands of Liberians, both military and civilians. As the NFPL forces advanced towards Monrovia, the capital of Liberia in 1990, they specifically targeted people from the Crown and Mandingo ethnic groups who remained loyal to the Doe government. And as the war continued, at least six other factions became involved in the conflict, including the United Liberian Movement of Liberia for Democracy, these names, uh, ULIMO, the LOFA Defense Force, and many members of the armed forces of Liberia who were still loyal to Doe's government. Uh, 1990, Taylor's NFPL troops capture most of the country. Uh, on August 24th, 1990, 3,000 ECOMOG forces arrive in Liberia. ECOMOG, the Economic Community of West African States Monitoring Group, another one of the many armies fighting in this complicated and fractured uh, civil war. During the same month, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of Western African States, 
a regional political and economic union of 15 countries located in West Africa. They hold a meeting in Gambia where Dr. Amos Sawyer is appointed as Liberian president, uh, the president of an interim government of national unity, the IGN, IGNU. But Sawyer's Monrovia-based IGNU not recognized by rebel leader Charles Taylor who is now based just outside Monrovia and controls, again, most of the country. Liberia is now divided. It has two effective seats of government, one in the country, one out, uh, two effective currencies. It's a land of blood and chaos. Roughly 620,000 people will die in this first civil war. Over 200,000 of them will be civilians. Over 200,000! On September 9th, 1990, Samuel Doe is tortured and then executed by Prince Johnson, another player in all this shit, and his rebel group the Independent National Patriotic Front of Liberia, INPFL, which had been waging a separate campaign against the government. Yet another faction. Uh, the INPFL actually consisted of men who previously broke away from Charles Taylor's NPFL. Uh, Doe's death is horrific. He's taken to Prince Johnson's military base. Apparently some of Johnson's men uh, thought that Doe was protected by black magic, because of course, all presidents are usually protected by black magic, and that they wouldn't be able to truly harm or kill him. To prove to his men that Doe is not protected by black magic, Johnson orders that Doe's ears be cut off in Johnson's presence, and then he chews on one of the ears. And I found a video online where you can watch one of this dude's ears get cut off. Uh, should not have watched it. <laughs> I am too curious sometimes, and you can't unsee that shit. Uh, then some of Doe's fingers and toes are also cut off. Finally, after 12 straight hours of torture, Doe is murdered, and then his corpse exhibited naked in the streets of Monrovia. This is fucking Mad Max. Uh, the spectacle of his torture, videotaped, seen on news reports around the world. Uh, the video shows Johnson sipping a beer. It's one of, yeah, Doe's ears are cut off, the video I saw. Uh, you can tell that he and his men are just used to shit like this when you watch the video. Like, they've just known so much violence. Like, they've become incredibly jaded. Like, in the room, while this guy's ear is being cut off, some of them are not even paying attention. They're just having side conversations. Like, it's fucking boring to them that the president of the country is on the ground being held down having his fucking ear cut off with a knife. And they're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, did you see that soccer game last night? Oh, wow, man. Three to one. I, I didn't, ex I thought it'd be a closer game. I thought it'd be a closer game. Uh, 1991, now 19-year-old General Butt Naked joins all this madness. Hail Nimrod, and here we fucking go. He and other members of his tribe decide to join up with the Mandigo tribe to form yet another faction, the ULIMO, uh, United Liberian Movement for Democracy. Like the Crowns, the Mandigos were also targeted by Charles Taylor's NPFL because of their support for the Doe regime. In July of 1991, a family member of one of the victims of Butt Naked's brutality witnessed something nightmarish. She would later tell this story to Der Spiegel, a German news agency. Uh, Faith Gua was 16 in July of 1991. She and her family were living on the outskirts of a small town in eastern Liberia, when they tuned their radio to the BBC, they heard news about the war. They wondered whether they should stay or leave. Uh, should have left. A group from the Crown Tribe was searching for enemies in the area. And at this time, any or, or an enemy was any member of any other tribe. And her older brother, Daniel, was hiding a nanny from the Geo Tribe, who had been working for their family for years. Uh, Faith heard the screams outside the huts as men approached. Suddenly, she saw a naked man with only a machete in his hand. Joshua Bly, General Butt Naked. Why is this man naked, she wondered. Then she saw the other men, about 25 of them, carrying guns. Uh, what the fuck? This dude walking around with a, nothing but a machete, leading a bunch of dudes with machine guns. How surreal. Uh, Bly and his men had heard that there was a geo woman in the village. Daniel stood in front of the, uh, the nanny to protect her. And he says to Bly, she's a human being like you and me. And then Bly responds with an order. And one of the men, boys actually, one of his child soldiers, steps forward chops off Daniel's foot with a hack of his machete. Then after Daniel, blood now spurting everywhere, falls to the ground screaming. Uh, this soldier hacks off his lower leg. Then while he is still alive, the dude hacks off his thigh, then his hip, methodically working his way with machete hacks up his body until eventually Faith's brother falls silent. Bly then tells everybody to lay on the ground and once they do, his men rape her mother and her sisters and the nanny and then kill him. In face words, they didn't rape me, but they did things to me that I don't want to talk about. They left me with a blemish that I will always have. Huh. Uh, at some point, Bly says that things were, are moving too slowly and that there are other military operations to attend to, and then they, they take off. Uh, when she spoke to reporters in 2013, Faith wasn't sure why they didn't kill her that day. Her best guess is that by the time they left, they just thought she was already dead. 
1992, Taylor and the NFPL launch a large-scale attack on Monrovia called Operation Octopus. The siege of the capital lasts for two months and traps ECO WAS troops in this ongoing civil war. Taylor's men inflict massive casualties, but they're still unable to take total control of Liberia. Um, 1993, there's a split in ULIMO, the group Bly is fighting with. Bly later writes that infighting in the group results in the deaths of several Crown tribe members. Uh, and, and that some crown people then want him to become their priest because of course they do. He's God's hero. Uh, but Mr. Butt Naked turns him down and says he'll fight as a warrior instead. He also says he told him that because he was con consenting to reduce his status from priest to warlord, he should be allowed to make as many sacrifices as he wants. Right? He needs to stay alive by making child sacrifices. If only he could just eat cola nuts to be bulletproof. In his words... This decision was pleasing to the military leaders, but not to the political leaders because my numerous killings would hinder their political ambitions. Shit is all so crazy. Uh, not sure how much of this to believe, but many, many people will later testify that Butt Naked did kill a lot of people, that he did eat a lot of people, that he did so much heinous shit in this civil war, you know, that he really did lead lots of child soldiers. So while I doubt anyone was asked him to be some important priest, I do believe he told people he wanted to, uh, you know, take a lot of sacrifices. After this supposed meeting, Bly gets back to fighting. During a typical battle, Bly says, uh, describes, you know, what a typical battle would be like, preparation. He says, before leading my troops into battle, we would get drunk and drugged up, sacrifice a local teenager, drink their blood, then strip down to our shoes and go into battle wearing colorful wigs and carrying imaginary purses we'd looted from civilians. We'd slaughter anyone we saw, chop their heads off, use them for soccer balls. We were nude, fearless, drunk, yet strategic. We killed hundreds of people, so many I lost count. What the fuck? Imagine that scene. <laughs> and I know this dude makes up a lot of shit, but after watching the Vice documentary and other documentary foot footage of Liberian Civil War battles, I absolutely believe this insane Mad Max shit played out in real life. And actually, uh, with this scene, you can find pictures online of Liberian child soldiers dressed up like they're going to Burning Man or some rave with AK-47s and machetes running wild through the streets of Monrovia. It's nuts. Can you imagine living in a war-torn city like this? You're already afraid for your life. You've been hearing gunfire every fucking day for years. You're used to it. You've acclimated as much as you can to life in this never-ending war zone. And then you see these motherfuckers. You see General Butt Naked. His only weapons are a swinging dick and a machete. You see him cut up some kid, drink the kid's blood, pass the body around to child soldiers dressed up like uh, like they're going to fucking Burning Man. Uh, they cut some kid's head off then kick it around like a soccer ball. They're drunk. They're high. They're headed towards your house. And what do you do? Do you hide? Do you run? Do you try and fight? Do you kill yourself to avoid the horror they're going to bring to you? I mean, this all sounds like a scene out of The Walking Dead. Real life in 90s, you know, in the 90s in Monrovia was scarier than most horror films. Like some real life purge shit. Time-traveling Karen uh, would lose her mind if she witnessed any of this. Are you fucking serious? What? Oh my God. Who do you people think you are? What, run around waving your guns and drinking kids' blood? How dare you point that gun at me? Do you know who you're talking to? Do you know who you're talking to? What kind of shit show, Civil War coup attempt are you running? Who's your manager? Who's your, that guy with the machete swinging his dick around? General Butt Naked? Hey, Mr. Butt Naked? I've got a bone to pick with you. Get your hands off me. I can't, I can't, you just cut my foot off, you dick. That hurt. Are you drinking my blood? Are you fucking serious? Uh, for real, seriously though. This whole no notion of child soldiers, how tragic. So many kids will fight in Liberia's civil wars. As many as 20,000 child soldiers fought in Liberian civil wars, serving as spies, sentries, human mind sweepers, soldiers of all other types. Most uh, forcibly conscripted, you know, sometimes at gunpoint or at least many. Others joined out of desperation, seeking food or physical protection. Uh, many of Bly's small soldiers, as he would call them, uh, as young as only nine years old. According to some accounts, Bly mashed cocaine into their food, right? Just uh, fucking drugged them sneakily and then showed them Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, trying to convince them that war was just an act, right? Oh, just, just, you know, just TV. He later said, I tried to uproot their fear of death. Oh, come on, shoot those machine guns, you know, coked up kiddos. This is all just a game. This is all just showbiz. Just fun and, just fun and games. Just pull that trigger. That's how I do it in Hollywood. Come on, we're just, we're just playing. 
In their intoxicated states, these boys would waltz into battle wearing flowing dresses, colorful wigs, carrying, you know, those dainty purses looted from civilians. Uh, They would take ghoulish glee in displaying their trophies. They would do shit like post a victim's head uh, on a table set in the middle of a Monrovia intersection. They'd create these little nightmare scenes. And, And Bly committed even more ghoulish acts. In his words, he describes how he selected random children to be sacrificed. He said, sometimes I would enter under the water where the children were playing. I would dive under the water grab one, carry carry him under, and break his neck. Sometimes I'd cause accidents. Sometimes I'd just slaughter them. You know, just casual. Just talking about killing kids. Between 1993 and 1995, a series of peace treaties is signed in Benin, uh, Ghana, and Nigeria to end this nightmare, but none of them work. There's just too many warring factions. The fighting and atrocities continue. They keep mounting up. On April 6, 1996, the siege of Monrovia takes place. An estimated 3,000 people are killed that day when five factions converge in an intense battle. Uh, The crisis begins when the Council of State attempts to arrest Roosevelt Johnson, an ethnic crown and leader of the ULIMO Johnson branch, another faction, uh, on murder charges. Johnson takes refuge in the military barracks of the former AFL, the... (laughs) Ulamoj, Liberian Peace Council, the LPC, and remnants of the AFL, all largely consisting of ethnic crown fighters, rally at the barracks, engage the combined forces of the NPFL and the ULIMO Chroma branch. <laughs> it just keeps like fracturing further and further out. Blind, his small soldiers are set loose on the city. Uh, first, General Buttnaked goes to Robertsport for arms, a city about a four hour drive up the Liberian coast from Monrovia. Uh, there, General Butt Naked. Um, did I mention he got his name because he fights naked? I, I assume I did. I assume you figured that out if I didn't. Uh, he picks up a rocket-propelled grenade, um, one M60 machine gun, two G3 machine guns, one AK-47. He has about 60 boys with him. He decides to move on to some ECO MOG soldiers at the John F. Kennedy Hospital, the Central Government Hospital in Liberia. He and his boys find a dozen more weapons there. From there, he brings his group to join forces with fighting men, uh, of the Liberia Peace Council. <laughs> so many groups. It's ridiculous. They still need more weapons, so Bly decides to hit up the Ghanaian contingent guarding the airport. One of the men on his side, Roosevelt Johnson, offers the commander of the Ghanaian contingent $10,000 US dollars to turn over their arms. The commander turns down the offer, and Bly responds by bringing out a POW, General Domingo, and orders his boys to cut him into 50 pieces if they won't give them weapons. Doesn't mention whether or not his men actually cut the general up, but they do apparently get 72 weapons from the Ghanaians. And then General Butt Naked uh, causes a lot of chaos across the city. One bystander later reports witnessing Bly standing naked atop a truck during this battle, covered in blood, holding an assault rifle in one hand and some dude's dick in the other. His severed dick. Had to get himself a little good luck charm. In the ensuing days of chaos, he has all sorts of other evil shit. He says at one point he kills a baby. He just grabs some little baby, just some little newborn, less than a year old baby by its, you know, legs and just bashes it against a wall. He he says the baby's brain and what Bly describes as everything inside the baby was used to cast the spirit of fear on his enemies. He's out of his fucking mind. He thinks this stuff is pleasing his God and keeping him alive. At least that's what he says. Uh, Bly says it was shortly after the siege of Monrovia that his conversion to Christianity takes place. And this sounds like like a story straight out of the Bible. He says he's about to fight in another battle. He's negotiating with the mother of a three-year-old girl to have this mom give him that little girl to be sacrificed. He says that she accepted his request for some reason uh, because of his spiritual influence. God, I hope that's not true. I hope some mom didn't actually give him her three-year-old daughter to be sacrificed. What a fucking dark negotiation that is. How much for your daughter? I want to sacrifice her for protection in battle. Go fuck yourself, you monster. Go to hell. I'll give you $200 Gap gift card and a case of cherry Coke. Uh, she's out back by the swing set. Uh, good luck in your battle. Uh, Bly wrote that after a negotiation, he took the little girl back to his soldiers, began his getting ready for battle sacrifice ritual. He opens up the girl's back with a knife, literally rips out her heart, cuts it into pieces. The soldiers eat pieces of the little girl's heart. <laughs> this is so fucking insane. Bly commands his men to get him some water to wash his hands. As he waits for them to return, he claims to have heard a voice behind him say, my son, why are you enslaving yourself? I feel like the, the voice should have said, like, my son, what the fuck did you just do that? That's a baby, you piece of shit. Uh, according to him, he turns around to see a very bright white light and a 10-foot tall man with clouds around his feet. Mm-hmm. Clouds around his feet? Okay. The mysterious man tells him again that he's, he's living his life as a slave and says, repent and live or refuse and die. 
before he disappears. And then the apparition disappears. And then, uh, you know, he goes into battle uh, like normal. And then this time, for the first time in the battle, he's afraid to die. He's shaken up by some new feeling of fear, he says. Sometime later, Joshua says he's at his house on Camp Johnson Road. He gets a knock at the door, opens it, sees a casually dressed man who says, Jesus loves you, General. And apparently this guy is from the Soul Winning Evangelical Ministries, a group that was active in Liberia during the war. He persuades Joshua to attend a meeting. A few days later, some missionaries come over, bring him to this meeting. On the way, as he's crossing a road, who should show up but his old friend and God, Nyagawe, right? The God that is such a big fan of his, the God that thinks he's a hero, uh, his hero. And this God tries to persuade him not to go to the meeting, saying, you know, like he's disobeying the gods of his fathers. <laughs> this is so weird, dude. Like what a weird thing to claim here. Like he's on the way to talk to a new God. And this old God's like, come on, don't, don't. come on, no, please. You're being a dick. Come on, dude. Uh, and then Joshua says he discovers he has free will and he goes to the meeting anyway. He's like, I don't need, I don't need you, old God. I got a new God. And he, then he sees an angel standing by the door. And then he's angels like, yeah, good job, buddy. And then he goes on in and the meeting is presided over by, uh, pastor John Kun Kun. And pastor John Kun Kun asks if anyone at the meeting wants to join the ministry. And Joshua says he has another vision of an angel. And uh, this time he is transported and uh, he's, he's out by some river, this angel. And this angel's talking to him. And this angel tells him he is the protector of everything. You know, because he's the fucking best person ever. He's so important. Uh, but Joshua still isn't fully on board. And then the fi figure asks him if he remembers how uh, Naya Gaewe, his old God, told him he couldn't eat cola nuts. And he's like, yeah, he did say that. And then the figure tells him that cola nuts are totally fine to eat. You can touch them, eat them, whatever you want. And if you go ahead, go eat them and you won't die. And that proves that Nigeria is full of shit. He's a false god. <laughs> I thought we were done with cola nuts in this story, by the way. A lot of cola nuts in this story. Uh, finally, this vision says to Joshua, go and tell the world about the vision you have seen of me and tell them I truly exist. And then Joshua jumps up in church. He snaps out of his trance. He runs down to the, the, the market and he says he eats 70 Liberian dollars worth of cola nuts. And then nothing happens. He doesn't even die. Probably gets a stomachache though. And then he starts racing around singing, if you think I'm crazy, I'm crazy for Jesus. This is his words. If you think I'm crazy, he is fucking crazy. I think you're crazy about a lot more than Jesus, you fucking psychopath. <laughs> I also don't think any of this happened. I don't believe this story anymore than I believe the story about his old God telling him that he's, you know, God's hero in the eating chalk in the fucking side of the rock or whatever. Uh, as Joshua is becoming a Christian and kicking his nasty habit of eating children, the first Liberian civil war winds to a close. When the Abuja Accord Supplement is signed on August 17th, 1996, the Accord provides for an immediate ceasefire, disarmament of all combatants by the end of January 1997, uh, reintegration, nationwide election scheduled for May of 1997, with an elected government to be installed by June 15th, 1997. The Accord also provides for sanctions for any faction which does not comply with the terms of the Peace Accord. Sanctions include travel restrictions, exclusion from the electoral process, and the establishment of a war crimes tribunal. This accord finally leads to a real ceasefire and elections. On July 19th, 1997, after seven years of mayhem, Charles Taylor is elected president of Liberia after campaigning on the slogan of, he killed my ma, he killed my pa, I'll vote for him. Seriously. That's his fucking campaign slogan. Yeah, I killed your parents, but you still should vote for me. This is how, ins this is how insane it is over there. Uh, <laughs> this phrase is darkly ironic. Uh, Taylor is claiming to be the only leader powerful enough to prevent another war. You need a psychopath like me in charge to, to keep other psychopaths in line. Uh, once in office, you know, it's more of the same chaos. Uh, Taylor uses the Liberian military to uh, go after his enemies, including General Butt Naked. Fearing for his safety, Butt Naked flees to Ghana, where for much of the next 10 years, he will live in a refugee camp. There he will, lead, he will learn to read and write. He'll study the Bible. Uh, he'll deliver sermons in the camp and then later throughout other parts of Africa. 1999, Liberia descends into civil war again. A new rebel group surfaces in Liberia, the Liberians United for Reconciliation and Democracy, LERD. <laughs> and LERD's only political goal is to force Taylor out of office. Uh, the group receives support from other exiled Liberian forces and other African countries, Europe and the US, especially from the government of neighboring Guinea. When Taylor then invades Guinea in 2000, uh, fighting between LERD and Taylor's forces will last until 2003. In early 2002, Lurd troops outmaneuver Taylor's forces, end up just 27 miles from Monrovia. Under leaders Kana and Thomas Nimely, Lurd troops mount successful raids that bypass government strongholds. And in May, they stage a bold attack on Arthington, less than 12 miles from Monrovia. 
In early 2003, a second rebel group called the Movement for Democracy in Liberia, MODAL, uh, backed by the government of the Ivory Coast, emerges in the South to challenge the Taylor government as well. So many fucking groups fighting. I am so thankful. I do not live in a place like this. I don't live in the midst of continual barbaric civil war and militia violence led by fucking psychopath warlords like General Butt Naked. Uh, by May of 2003, Taylor now only controls about one third of Liberia. Rebels are closing in on Monrovia from all sides. In July of 2003, lured forces reached the outskirts of Monrovia and began a siege of the capital. In the subsequent shelling of the city, over 1,000 civilians are killed, thousands more made homeless. On August 11th, 2003, President Charles Taylor resigns and flees to exile in Nigeria. A week later, on August 18th, the Accra Comprehensive Peace Agreement announces the forming of the National Transition Government of Liberia with Gweed Bryant as president. Not sure how to say his name. Uh, the second civil war is finally over after claiming over 300,000 lives. Uh, additional lives, more than the first civil war, uh, the, you know, more lives on top of. The agreement also scheduled Liberia's first post-civil war national election for 2005. It is insane that over a million people die between the two wars. In the 2005 election, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf becomes the 24th president of Liberia and the first woman to lead an African nation. In 2007, Butt Naked returns to Liberia and he founds Journeys Against Violence, a rehabilitation program for young men who fought in the civil wars. The JAV rents a bright yellow cinder block house in Monrovia, uh, in a suburb of Monrovia called Chocolate City. Sounds so nice. I love chocolate, <laughs> but you couldn't pay me enough to live there. Uh, 18 young men, all in their 20s or 30s, live there sharing three small bedrooms crammed with bunk beds. Ernest Nelson, Bly's half-brother, is JAV supervisor. Uh, Bly's mother works as a cook. One of the program's drivers is his cousin. JAV requires abstinence from drugs and alcohol, enforces a regimen of daily prayer, on a sheet of paper taped to the wall of the common room are the Ten Commandments of the house. Stuff like no fighting, you know, no food for lazy men. Uh, is Bly a good dude now? I have my doubts. I think he just found a, a, a new way to make money. Uh, more on this later. In early 2008, Bly confesses to a lot of the terrible shit he did. When he testifies at the Liberian government's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, formed to bring justice to victims of the First and Second Civil Wars. The proceedings are broadcast live across the country on radio and TV. Bly is the first former warlord to testify. At the beginning of the 132-minute hearing, they ask him a question, how many victims were there? The footage from the hearing shows Bly sitting there dressed in these white trousers, white shirt, white shoes. He's, you know, he's traded the purple outfit from when he used to sell Kool-Aid at the grocery store for the white one here. And, and he's just pondering this question, like, how many had he killed? And he says, if I were to calculate, if you're talking about April 6th or throughout the war or every evil I've done, it should not be less than 20,000. <laughs> That's fucking insane. During the course of two hours, he describes his role in the war. He says that he used human sacrifice and cannibalism to gain magical powers. He said, I needed to make human sacrifices to appease the said deities or the gods. Every town I entered, they would give me the chance to do my human sacrifices, which included innocent children. The record of this hearing is kept on file in Liberia's National Archive. Now, here's some more of what was said. I recruited children who were nine or 10 years old. Is this correct? He's asked. Yes. I planted violence into them. I explained to them that killing people was a game. Is this correct? Correct. When I shot and wounded an enemy, I would rip open his back and eat his live heart. Is this correct? And he, then he says, let me be more precise. I also laid down the body and had my child soldiers cut the person to pieces so they wouldn't have any feelings for people. This What an insane interrogation. Like if this happened in the US or just... <laughs> like any country that wasn't like Mad Max type shit. Can you imagine just uh, like turning on C-SPAN or whatever, you know, just CNN, uh, Fox News, whatever, just hearing somebody uh, being asked questions like this, like a free person, a person who hasn't even been arrested. And then, and then they're, you know, they're asked like, so you, uh, you ripped open people's backs and ate their live hearts. Is that right? Actually, let me take it further. Uh, I would cut, uh, you know, the, the person to pieces and I would, uh, you know, have my child soldiers uh, eat all the pieces. So they would hate people. Okay. All right. Good. Glad we cleared that up. Uh, then they ask, are you the same Joshua Bly? They now call Bly the evangelist. Yes, ma'am. Why did you decide in light of this past to come to the truth and reconciliation commission? He says, for my faith, I was told that I should tell the truth and the truth will set me free. Okay. He then tells the story of his conversion to Christianity, <laughs> uh, which took place shortly after the April 6th battle. The, uh, you know, we saw the dude with the cloud feet and stuff. Uh, the commissioner is apparently enthralled by Bly's account, challenge a few of his claims. One of them comments uh, also, one of them seems to be impressed and says, you have a lot of good leadership qualities. What the fuck? 
what? It, it, how is this a real place? <laughs> After all this, some commissioner's like, hey, I like your story, dude. I'm not going to lie. I didn't care for the parts of eating kids. Uh, other than that, other than some of the raping you mentioned and the torture and, you know, and the coking up the kids uh, as young as nine to, you know, fight for you in battle and tricking them with action movies. I like what you're about. Under your monstrous nightmare from hell, tough guy exterior, I think there's a good dude in there, a really solid leader. Uh, in 2009, Liberia's Truth and Reconciliation Commission issues a 500-page report. It called for the creation of a war crimes court with the power to bring charges. It recommended the prosecution of 116 of the war's most notorious perpetrators, including Prince Johnson, that person who cut the ears off uh, after that coup. Uh, the report suggests that 49 politicians who had supported rebel factions, including President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, they, they should be banned from holding public office for 30 years. Uh, why her? Because uh, Sirleaf admitted to providing $10,000 to Charles Taylor early in the war. Near the end of the report, the commission recommends pardoning, giving full pardons to 38 people, despite them having committed human rights violations uh, for speaking truthfully before the commission and expressing remorse for their prior actions. One of these pardons is general butt naked. After all that shit he did, they're like, okay, I appreciate you telling the truth. And again, imagine that in another country. Imagine like, uh, <laughs> like they finally catch Ted Bundy. And it's like, listen, before you arrest me, can I just talk this out? Sure. Yeah. I fucking raped and killed a lot of people. But I saw Jesus pop up in a cloud, you know? And I feel bad. And I want to make things right. And they're like, okay. I like this guy. I like his leadership skills. Uh, <laughs> a Nobel Peace Prize laureate who gave one shitty dude 10, 000, or 10, you know, 10 grand before he showed himself to be a really shitty dude, that, that person's not fit to lead. They want that person banned from public office uh, for 30 years. But the, but the guy who was the shittiest of shitty dudes, uh, good leader. Let's keep, keep up the great work. Thanks for being honest. Uh, 2011, a documentary comes out called The Redemption of General Butt Naked. After seeing this movie, uh, Brenda Weber, a devout Christian from Walnut, Illinois, who managed, who managed a small pharmacy with her husband, contacted Bly on Facebook. Uh, they talked several times on the phone. I could tell that he was genuine, she says later. I knew that he wasn't the same person, that he was a totally different man. Shortly after, she founds a small nonprofit specifically to support Bly's work. This is when I mentioned earlier that I don't really buy all this. I feel like he's still a con artist. This is the main evidence, I think, why. She provides most of the money to rent a house, the house in Chocolate City and to buy food, bunk beds, and supplies for him. Beginning in 2012, Weber starts sending Bly around $800 a month Half is meant to cover food for his outreach program. The other half is for him personally. Uh, other American donors also now start giving money. They go to Bly and his staff. And, and Weber's money might not sound like a lot, but even if just the $400 a month were being kept for Bly and his family, and he was using the rest for good purposes, uh, the average Liberian earns just $38 a month. So this is actually a, a lot of money he's getting for his, you know, compared to people around him. After a year, Weber gives him so much money, she wipes out her family's $40,000 savings. So I think she ended up giving him a lot more than $800 a month. At one point, Weber took out a $50,000 line of credit and sold some of her coach handbags at a garage sale to keep supporting General Bud Naked. Uh, she said later, I know everything's going to be fine. You can't give and give like that and not get something in return. Uh, yeah, you can. No, you can't, Brenda. Uh, you can when you get conned. April 26, 2012, the special court for Sierra Leone finds Liberia's former president, Charles Taylor, guilty of aiding and abetting war crimes and crimes against humanity in the first ever international judgment against a former head of state. Uh, presiding Judge Richard Lussick said Thursday that 64-year-old warlord turned President Taylor provided arms, ammunition, communications equipment, and planning to rebels responsible for countless atrocities in the 1991 to 2002 Sierra Leone Civil War. Dude, finally getting into lots of trouble. Not even for anything he did in Liberia. And this is also crazy. Well, all this insane shit has been going on in Liberia, equally insane shit has been going on next door in Sierra Leone. Uh, Lustig calls the support sustained and significant. Taylor pleads not guilty to 11 counts, including murder, rape, terror, and conscripting child soldiers. Among the atrocities detailed that he uh, helped commit was the beheading of civilians. Apparently, victims' heads were often displayed by Taylor's men at checkpoints. On one occasion, a man was killed, publicly disemboweled, and his intestines were stretched across the road to form another checkpoint. Fuck. Taylor was the first former head of state to face judgment in an international court on war crimes since judges in Nuremberg convicted the admiral who led Nazi Germany for a brief period following Hitler's suicide. And he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. 72 years old now, he's still behind bars in Britain, incarcerated at HM Prison Franklin in County Durham, England. And he's still fucking with Liberia from prison. 
In January of 2017, it was found that he had been making phone calls from the prison to provide guidance to the National Patriotic Party and to threaten his enemies. <sighs> what about General Butt Naked? What's he up to? In an article in The New Yorker, uh, they talk about what Bly's doing now. He preaches the word of God, visits the families of his victims, seeking forgiveness. Uh, he lives in New Georgia Estate, a suburb of Monrovia. His house is mustard colored and modest with a flickering power supply and no running water. And sadly, like that's like one of the nice houses <laughs> for this area. Uh, and though he's still running JAV, some of the people the reporter interviewed for the article seem to doubt that it's legit as everyone says it is. They say Bly seems more concerned with his image than residents' actual problems. One JAV resident of the house pulled a reporter aside, told him that Bly was misappropriating the program's money for his own benefit. Not surprised. Sometimes the young man said the residents of the house went without breakfast or their meals would consist of plain rice with just salt and pepper. When Western reporters would arrive, they would be given better food. Bly and his staff would say, okay, stand in front of the camera and tell them this and that. Tell them that you're Joshua Bly beneficiaries. And then he says, but what have I benefited? So is this guy telling the truth? I have no clue. But if I had to guess, I'd say he probably is. Uh, yeah, Bly is still preaching. Uh, I do have to give him some credit here, I guess. He is trying to apologize to his victims. An article from March of this year reported that Bly urged the Liberian government to take a more proactive role in punishing former warlords because otherwise the families and friends of the victims would come, uh, would come after them, creating a cycle of violence. According to him, true and lasting freedom can only be actualized in Liberia if people are made to pay, including him, for their unlawful actions perpetrated against peaceful citizens. He said, I see the establishment of the war crime court as a support against violence. I am here to give me and my organization support for justice in this country. Many people may think that I am confused or crazy. Uh, ding, ding, ding. I do. But if this is a step, uh, but if this step is a step of confusion, then I will embrace it. I have a parable that I always project. If a man went out to steal an, an angry, and an angry crowd is running behind him, if he had his wife and children home, running to his house is not the best place because the angry crowd will kill his children. The best thing is to give yourself up so that the anger of the people you have hurt will not reach your children. Okay, I'll give him some credit there, right? That's a, a nice, you know, theoretical amends to make buddies. You know, he's still free. So we'll see if this actually happens. And with that, maybe a little bit of an uplifting note, uh, let's hop out of this timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Man, what a crazy story. I deviated from the notes uh, more than usual just because I've been watching more than I needed for this episode. I hope that didn't make it distracting, but uh, it's just so wild. The butt naked, still free. Still walking around free. Never, you know, incarcerated for admitting all that insane shit. Uh, you know, he's completely owned up to killing fellow Li Liberians, many of them children. Is there any chance that eventually Joshua Bly and other warlords like him will, will face any real punishment? Probably not. So I, I think those, you know, nice words he said at the end of the timeline, probably a little hollow because I think he's smart enough to know that he's not actually ever going to get in trouble. Uh, Liberia does not even seem able to be or to be able to to stick to the idea that former warlords should not be in politics, much less be apprehended. In 2011, Liberia's Supreme Court ruled that the proposal to remove politicians involved in war crimes from office was unconstitutional. Ah, come on. They committed some war crimes, sure. But that was a couple years ago. Uh, creating a war crimes court in Liberia would require the approval of the legislature in which Prince Johnson, the ear cutter and other former warlords still serve and would result in the prosecution of a sizable portion of the country's rulers. So it's never going to happen. Uh, many Liberians now enjoying relative security compared to the Civil War days fear that such an overhaul could plunge the country back into chaos and conflict. So nobody really wants it. There's peace, you know, uh, but there is also so much poverty in Liberia. So the, the peace is always fragile and they don't want to fuck with it. Uh, what about Bly's former child soldiers and other former Liberian child soldiers? What are they up to now? What does being a child soldier do to a meat sack brain that isn't fully developed yet? More than 38,000 children are estimated to have taken part in Liberia's wars as fighters, porters, ammunition carriers, cooks, sex slaves sometimes. Uh, what they saw and did still sticks with them today, of course, when they're somewhere between 25 and 40 years old now. Uh, they're living with just about the worst memories one can have. One study of the mental health effects of the intertwined wars in Liberia and Sierra Leone found that the atrocities these child soldiers committed, including included intentional hacking off of limbs, which we mentioned earlier, is what these kids you know, did in the war, carving the initials of rebel factions into victim's skin. Uh, this one's real bad. Slaughtering pregnant women to bet on the gender of the unborn child. 
uh, use of young girls as human sacrifices. Numerous people have reported they were forced to cut, cook, eat, and serve human flesh and internal organs, including those of their own parents and infants. Holy shit. How does one ever recover from something like that? Countless numbers of children and teenagers forced to watch the torture, rape, brutal murders of their parents and siblings. In many cases, family members, including children, were forced to rape, murder, and mutilate each other. It was, just, it was hell. It was hell on earth. During these acts, victims were forbidden to show any emotion or in many cases were commanded to laugh. In some instances, people who shed tears in response to these atrocities were punished by being permanently blinded. In the aftermath of the wars, the government and Western aid agencies created programs to help former child soldiers re-enter society, but many have been unable, as you can imagine, to build normal lives, especially the girls and women whose soldier past is seen by sexist Liberian society as more of a social transgression. While many male commanders negotiated government positions after the war, female combatants have largely been excluded from that process. Today, many of the women who went to war are shunned. They live in slums, scraping by for survival, often by, you know, becoming sex workers for just a few dollars uh, a day in terrible brothels like the one I described earlier in West Point. Uh, Lena uh, Kotilian from the University of Turku in Finland, who is conducting a study on the reintegration of former girl soldiers, found that almost half of those she interviewed were involved in prostitution. Almost half. Most of them in ghettos throughout Monrovia. Some of them are so destitute and disempowered that they don't believe they are human beings anymore, she says. In a study on child soldiers in neighboring Sierra Leone, Teresa Betancourt, an associate professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, found that the psychological toll was greater on girls who had significantly higher levels of depression and anxiety than boys. Violence against women was so endemic during the civil wars that some surveys suggest that up to 90% of Liberia's girls and women during those years were raped, even girls acting as soldiers. In addition to their military duties, girls with the armed groups were raped and sexually enslaved by the fighters. One girl who spoke with Human Rights Watch, 14 at the time of her abduction, was raped by many, many fighters and then later assigned to a warlord to be his wife. Girl fighters collectively known as wives, whether attached to a particular soldier or not. Some older girls were able to avoid sexual abuse by capturing other girls and offering them up for sexual slavery. So crazy that this shit was going on while I was having the time of my life in college. Man, the world truly is not fair. Like, fuck books like The Secret and other bullshit about how, oh, you just gotta will it. Just good intentions. You just gotta will stuff into your life. Uh, the power of positivity is real. The power of positive thinking is real. Uh, hard work does increase your odds for success in life tremendously. But if you're stuck in Liberia, if you were born in Liberia a few years before these civil wars went down, you were just fucked. You were motherfucked. Uh, so what psychological effects are many people in Liberia currently suffering from? According to a paper published by the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University, causing children to fight in war is basically abusing a child in three different ways at once. Corrupting them, terrorizing them, and isolating them. Uh, the corruption of a child is a form of abuse achieved by making the child engage in destructive and or antisocial behavior. You know, uh, encouraging them to uh, engage in acts of killing, destruction, sabotage. As a consequence of corruption, the child becomes unable to engage in normal social experiences. Another form of abuse is the terrorization of a child, the fear of running for their life, the feelings of hunger, thirst, and pain that children too often experience in armed conflict also constitute forms of terrorization. Among military ranks, terrorization is often guised as a form of discipline. Uh, being subject to strict military discipline during childhood constitutes psychological abuse. Isolating a child from his or her normal social experience uh, estranging him or her from normal family life and schooling, uh, emotional abuse. In the life of a child soldier, children constantly find themselves in a position that breaks down dichotomies between civilian and combatant, victim and perpetrator, initiate and initiated, protected and protector. With these multiple in-between positions, child soldiers simultaneously bear multifaceted identities and develop the lack of a permanent, stable, and socially defined place. Psy psychological consequences induced by these forms of abuse, abuse range from PTSD, major depression, pathological anxiety, and other forms of psychological distress. This makes child soldiers one of the most complex traumatized populations among children and adolescents. It is very hard for them to reintegrate back into society after the fighting stops in any meaningful and positive way. Hard drug use is rampant in Liberia today, especially heroin, of course it is. Anything to forget these nightmares. Okay, let's wrap up all this insanity now. Uh, General Butt Naked was a cannibal who preferred to sacrifice children and babies because he believed that their deaths promised him the greatest amount of magical protection. 
He went into battle naked, often carrying only a machete because he believed his sacrifices in fighting naked made him bulletproof. And he was, in fact, never hit by a single bullet. Uh, he corrupted his small soldiers so badly, uh, they do shit like make bets on whether a pregnant woman was carrying a boy or a girl, then slit open the belly to see who was right. Uh, during during the Liberian Civil Wars, uh, Civil Wars, uh, reporters brought home photos of child soldiers wearing Halloween masks and women's wigs, eating human hearts, uh, decorating streets, intersections with bones, other macabre displays. Bly, pay, Bly, pl <laughs> Bly paid a big role in all of this, and he's never faced punishment for what he did. Few people in the world have ever been accused uh, of atrocities like Bly, and none of them have ever responded to the accusations against him in the same way he did. When he testified in Liberian national television, Bly had no problem admitting to doing shit like eating kids. Unsurprisingly, not everyone believes that Joshua Bly is truly the man of God he says he is now. Nikolai Ledau, an, an independent scholar who wrote a doctoral dissertation at Stanford about Liberian rebel groups, says that Bly is a brilliant self-promoter who translated his notoriety from the war into personal gain. Right? He just, uh, he's playing up these stories to make money now. He's also clearly made a lot of stuff up to promote his story, including all that shit about being you know, God's hero. Now, God's hero doesn't put on purple clothes and sell Kool-Aid at the grocery store and then eat kids. Uh, Bly uh, even told a few of his patrons that Steven Spielberg uh, met him in Monrovia, offered him $900,000 for the rights to his life story. And then he turned down the offer because the director wanted to temper the religious aspects of his biography. Later, a journal journalist fact-checked this with uh, Marvin Levy, St Spielberg spokesperson, and Levy said Stan or Steven has never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, no fucking way. Steven Spielberg's. Just, you know, going to have a meeting with a former warlord who ate kids in Monrovia. Uh, could he be a good guy? A real redemption story? Maybe, but I doubt it. Uh, Bly does seem to be using at least some of his resources to rehabilitate former child soldiers and help them out. Uh, but then again, he's also probably misappropriating a lot of those funds. Uh, personally, I think he's just exploiting his former soldiers uh, in a new way now. Uh, I also think it might be a long time before I ever visit Liberia. Parts of Monrovia and the rest of the country do look truly beautiful. And I'm sure many people live wonderful lives there. But after learning what we've learned today, uh, probably not going to add it to my travel bucket list anytime soon. Time now for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Joshua Bly, a.k.a. General Butt Naked, was just one of many warlords that terrorized Liberia during the first Liberian Civil War, which lasted from 1989 to 1997. With his army of cocaine-fueled child soldiers, he terrorized cities and towns, performing human sacrifices, eating human flesh, and of course, fighting naked, because he thought that would make him immune to bullets. What a world we live in. Number two, despite all the fucked up shit he's done, Bly now claims to be a man of God. He's been active in establishing a rehabilitation center. He gets money from Christian donors across the world, and it might all be a scam he's running, so he can keep getting recognized and keep making money. Number three, warlords have existed long before Africa's recent civil wars. You can bet that with meat sacks, wherever there is a power vacuum, someone will step in to fill it and by any means necessary. Number four, Bly and many other Liberian warlords will probably never face justice for the many thousands of people they killed and tortured. There simply is not the infrastructure for it in Liberia. And some of the people who would need to pass the laws to make that happen are the former warlords themselves. Number five, new info. Uh, Mr. Butt Naked, far from the first person to put kids into an army during the Napoleonic Wars, so-called powder monkeys, boys as young as 10, helped arm cannons for the British Navy. In 1863, Congress awarded the Medal of Honor to a 13-year-old Union soldier in the United States. Kids have fought in battles for thousands of years. It wasn't until after the Second World War that international norms began to really shift away from child soldiers. By 1977, the Geneva Conventions prohibited recruiting anyone under the age of 15 into an armed force. Nevertheless, child soldiers continue to be used throughout the world. I mean, if you're a warlord living inside the blood and chaos of a place like Liberia in the 90s, what the fuck do you care about Geneva Conventions? Militia commanders continue to consider kids to be ideal fighters. Cheap, nimble, and psychologically malleable. Time suck. Top five takeaways. General Butt Naked has been sucked. That, to me, was one of the most fascinating topics we've covered all year. Uh, wow, uh, Liberia, thank God it is, compared to the Civil Wars, relatively calm now. What a crazy place that must have been to live for so many years. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making time. So Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, the script keeper, Zach Flannery, 
Sophie Fax Sorceress Evans, Bit Elixir, Logan Keith, the Art Warlock, running BadMagicMerch.com and the socials, along with Liz Hernandez. Thanks to all those who've joined the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group, moving towards 25,000 members now, who continue to make Time Suck a community. Praise Bojangles. Thanks to Liz and her all-seeing eyes running the Cult of the Curious Facebook page, and thanks to Beefsteak and the Mod Squad for keeping Discord fun for over 8,500 over there having a good time. And thanks to all you space lizards playing the Time Suck trivia game on the Time Suck app. Uh, Bodie 210 just won round five with 7,700 points. And you got a cool trophy, certificate, trivia champion, t-shirt, and $50 in a, in a merch gift certificate. Uh, next week, just in time for Christmas, another killer. Awkward timing, I know. <laughs> Don't blame me. Blame the space lizards. They voted it in. Uh, we'll have a year-end wrap-up and a little inspiration the following week. But next week, we discuss the Craigslist killer. His real name was Philip Markoff, and Philip liked the internet. Maybe a little too much. On the surface, Philip was a nice enough guy, second-year med school student with a fiancé named Megan, good family, bright future ahead of him, a six-foot-three straight-A student who'd uh, finished undergrad in just three years. He seemed like a decently well-adjusted, very intelligent guy. But his internet browsing history uh, would show a different side of him. Behind the scenes, without Megan or his family knowing, Philip was leading a secret life. He uh, had an addiction to poker and gambling online. He was uploading profiles to sexual fetish websites. He was using Craigslist to lure women working as sex workers into hotel rooms. And he would rob uh, some of these women, kill, a, kill another before authorities caught onto him and brought his secret life out into the open. Uh, calling him the Craigslist killer, while a catchy moniker, uh, not that accurate, really. It makes him sound like a serial killer. Uh, he was not a serial killer, believed to have only killed one person. Not that that's not terrible but not a serial killer. Uh, we're going to use this story to dive into some of the other people who've perpetrated a relatively new genre of crime, internet homicides. Just how unsafe can the internet be? It seems like every year the old rules about keeping safe, you know, like don't give out your personal information, don't get into a stranger's car, uh, go a little further out the window. Not getting into someone's car just is not as relevant in the age of Uber. Not meeting up with a stranger would mean that Tinder's entire business model would collapse. Uh, does this new technology make life more convenient? For sure. Does it also open us up to people who might not have the best intentions for us? Yes, also true. The story of Philip Markov's life and misdeeds, internet homicide, and more next week on Time Suck. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. After all that darkness, let's, let's kick off things with some good news. Uh, from a marvelous meat sack working towards ending the current pandemic, Courtney Coolis, Courtney writes, hail master of all, suckingdom. I uh, don't know if this is the right place, but I just wanted to give a quick COVID update. It is the right place, Courtney. Yeah, thanks for sending in your update to bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com. Courtney continues, I work at a facility called Catalant, Catalant in Indiana. We produce mainly injectable medicines such as vaccines and various other drugs that would be injected directly into the patient via a syringe or given intravenously. On top of all that, we are also the only producer of one of the major COVID vaccines. It is so close to being released to the public, and the whole facility got put into a bunch of overtime so we can get this medicine out to all the meat sacks that need it. I love my job because it allows me to work on something that actually helps people when they need it the most, and right now, the world really needs this. Sending out all the good vibes, hope I can get some in return, your fellow meat sack, Courtney. P.S. If this, by some miracle, makes it into the show, can you give a shout out to my boyfriend, Seth? We don't see each other during the week as we both work different shifts, but we both listen to Time Suck whenever we can. Seth, I love you more than anything. Also, if this does make it to the show, I know my name looks simple and it kind of is, but I'm German and Polish, so it's pronounced uh, Kulis. Uh, the is is like kiss or hiss. Thanks. Love the show. Keep doing what you're doing. Well, thank you, Courtney. If you wouldn't have put that pronunciation guide at the end there that I copied for the front, I would have I would have blew it. Uh, you keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for the overtime. Sounds like you're a lucky man, Seth. Courtney sounds fantastic. Uh, looking forward to having that vaccine roll out soon. I'm sure we'll be talking about anti-vaxxers again when many undoubtedly will refuse to take it. But I do think the overwhelming majority of people will. Oh, and everyone, uh, please do not write the word Polish in your messages uh, in the subject line or just in the body or anywhere. I, I set something up on my computer to have any message with that word go straight into junk mail. You get it. Now for some interesting thoughts on religion. An update to something I said on last week's Dark Ages Suck from Top Shelf Sack and cool-ass pastor Mike Moffat. Mike writes, Hey, since I know you have nothing better to do than to read my emails and think about how Tacoma is your favorite city of all time. Mike, Mike lives in Tacoma, where I've met him. Uh, and Time Suck makes me think about things like how Anton LaVey privately believed in God 
and in the nature of prophetic revelation, I wanted to add a quick thought to the question you asked on the Dark Ages suck. What if all the ancient proclaimers of God's revelations were no different than modern cult leaders we so enjoy mocking and marveling at? I learned a lot about this from teaching world religions for 11 years. A couple quick guidelines for this question. When discussing world religions, always avoid the world, always avoid the word always, never say never. You get it, avoid superlatives. The reason is that there are just too many nuances and subtleties amongst world religions and philosophies to be able to sweep them all under one category. Could anyone with intellectual integrity actually place Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, etc. in the same category as David Koresh or the Alamos? But comparing them is the right first step because a tree is known by its fruit. Okay, I show my bias on this one since that's a quote from Jesus, but I've had students trying to compare Muhammad to Jesus on the basis that they were both founders of new religions. Your excellent question about the criteria by which we judge such founders or cult leaders who saw themselves as doing the same is basically doing the same. Consider the human desire for power, the human desire for wealth, the human desire for fame, and the human desire for legacy. Then weigh any religious leader, founder, or even cult leader against these criteria. How much do these human tendencies guide the founder? Your cult leaders, all guided 100% by them. But can we say the same for all the other religious trailblazers in history? Again, my bias is that Jesus exemplified true witness to God because he was guided by none of those potentially destructive human tendencies. Check out his bio, aka the Gospels. Uh, I could be wrong, but would love the dialogue. By the way, the Buddha, one might suggest, is in the same category as Jesus on these criteria, but he's different in that he didn't bear witness to any sort of God or gods. So in the Dark Ages suck, I think what you identified was the corruption of the church in the Dark Ages and not the corruption of Jesus. The irony in suggesting Jesus might be no different from any corrupt religious charlatan is the fact that the only reason we can identify the church's corruption is by observing how far it strays from the character of God as revealed by Jesus himself. Okay, I'm done. Annie Oakley warmed my heart. The Dark Ages cooled it right off again. Shit motes, though, had me laughing out loud. Great name for a punk band. Peace, Pastor Mike, University Place, Washington. Well, thank you for your thoughts, Pastor Mike. They are always uh, excellent. Uh, you've laid out some great comparative criteria, but here's my dilemma. I wish we had more info about Jesus and Muhammad and other ancient religious figures. Uh, you know, speaking about Jesus and Muhammad, you know, uh, the only real info we have, uh, the Gospels and the Quran, and that's the only, only thing we have to make comparisons with. I wish we had like, you know, Dateline exposés on them and Vice documentaries and Netflix docuseries and numerous biographies and interviews of them, direct interviews that we could watch on YouTube. That would make a comparison so much easier because we would know them so much better. Uh, did Jesus care about power, fame, wealth, and legacy? Not according to the Gospels, but, Gospels, but how much did the Gospels really encapsulate all the years of life that he led? I wish I knew. Uh, I admire your faith, Pastor Mike. If it continues to give you peace and happiness and make you the good, caring dude uh, you've always seemed to be when I've met you, I hope you always keep it. Uh, thanks for giving us all more to think about and consider. Uh, now for a funny story about the Dark Ages suck. Uh, uh, a, a little funny story that the Dark Ages suck made super sucker John Carney think about. Uh, John writes, suck master flex. The Middle Ages suck reminded me of one of our best family stories. First off, this story could have been sent into Is We Dumb? Uh, thanks for mentioning Is We Dumb here, uh, with my podcast with Mr. Paisley. Uh, but since it is about my in-laws, time suck was a safer option. It could also have been sent to the secret suck for the immigration challenge. My wife's family escaped from Vietnam in the late 70s. I shit you not, their boat was attacked by pirates. That's a story from another time. Maybe cultural differences played a part in this story that we refer to as breakfast soup. My wife's parents don't get out much. For our wedding, they came out to visit and stayed at a local hotel near our home. They came from Arizona to California with my wife's sister and her husband. In the morning, my sister-in-law gets a phone call from her mom as she was enjoying the complimentary breakfast at the hotel. There was an urgent tone in her voice. She said, quick, come downstairs before it's all gone. They have breakfast soup. It's kind of like clam chowder, but with little pieces of meat in it. <laughs> my sister-in-law, still half asleep, thought it was strange to have such a thing at a breakfast bar. As a dutiful daughter, she got dressed, went downstairs. When she got there, she saw that her parents had consumed several bowls of gravy. <laughs> <laughs> and they were enjoying another. Yes, you read that right. Gravy. As you, you know, as in biscuits and gravy, but without the biscuits. I can only imagine what the staff thought at the end of the breakfast when they saw empty, an empty gravy trough and a full basket of biscuits. <laughs> this story makes my wife and I laugh every time we hear the words breakfast soup. 
Hail Nimrod, keep on sucking. Don't change a thing. Three out of five stars. Spaces are John Carney. Yes, Carney as in circus folk. At least I'm not Polish. I love the picture you paint so much, John. That is hilarious. Just down there in the lobby eating bowls of gravy for breakfast. Some breakfast soup. Medieval peasants would have been overjoyed to eat that sweet gravy. Uh, sounds a bit heavy for me. And I like biscuits and gravy for sure. But just a bowl, several bowls of sausage gravy. Don't think I'd get a lot done that day. Uh, now for some time suck trivia advice. I found this really uh, interesting. From super sucking trivia wizard and winner, Bodhi. Uh, Bodhi writes, hey guys, space wizard Bodhi here. Wanted to drop Dan and Joe some pro skills tips on how to get awesome trivia scores without needing to cheat. I had been doing pretty well in the scoring when trivia began, but started getting really serious about halfway through October. Things started getting close, so I figured I needed to reevaluate my tactics, which up until that point weren't really anything. Here's what I do. I listen to the suck uh, at work on Mondays. I would usually just listen to the episode and take the quiz, but being at work, my hands were usually wet. I wasn't wearing my glasses. So I came up with a better way of doing things. Pro skills time. I listened to both of the trivia episodes on Mondays. So the, yeah, the one, the new one, and then the old one that has the, the questions from that week. I, I don't worry about the trivia. When I get home, I will usually listen to one of the episodes again on my computer with the show notes up. And he sent pictures showing the system, listing show notes, uh, show notes up on a screen. Uh, so I'm reading along to reinforce the information in my head. Now I skip the ads, the jokes, the tangents, because I've already heard them. I won't get distracted with the Mr. X. As soon as the episode is done, I take the quiz on my phone. I make sure the phone is out of the case, flat on the table. I love the detail. So it doesn't wobble. Uh, I'll have a certain you know hand position using both hands to select answers and press the next arrow. I'm a gamer, so I have pretty fast reflexes in general. I've always been able to read quickly, so that helps more. So that's how I do it. Not really sure about anyone else's setup. That is fucking phenomenal. Uh, I'm not really writing this to be read in the podcast. Well, it is just to share the info with you guys. Also, I'm an admin for Bojangles Pets. So we've decided that we are going to adopt the Cowboy Pigeon Trophy as the group's mascot. I'm going to be setting up a poll in the group to decide his name. Thought you'd get a kick out of that. Uh, and Joe, I wish you could have seen just how badly my fiance was totally fangirling when she found out it was actually Joe Paisley she was playing Call of Duty with last night. I've never seen her lose her shit like that. It was so hilarious. Uh, anyways, we love you guys. Keep up the good work on all the podcasts. We'll continue to spread the suck. Keep on sucking. Bodie, P.S. We we Are Dan has totally become a thing now. Thank you, Bodie. Holy shit, that is dedication. You need to get on Jeopardy. Uh, that is awesome about the Bojangles Pets Group. Uh, hope that cowboy pigeon gets a sweet name. Maybe uh, Terry Five Bucks. Uh, and the Dan Facebow profile pic, uh, <laughs> just going kind of viral in the group. It's hilariously culty. So fucking weird. Uh, I love how ridiculous it is. Uh, you all are, are very hilarious. And congrats on winning, Bodie. Uh, and I'm glad you had fun. Uh, your wife had fun uh, playing with Joe on Call of Duty. And uh, yeah, I was going to answer one more thing, but then I remembered it's coming up. I was thinking of another uh, Time Sucker update. Now some wackadoodle madness and inspiration from Survivor Sucker, Ashley Dixon, who writes, Firstly, I'm so very sorry. I was recently at a bar while visiting Savannah, Georgia, and sat next to, as far as COVID would let the bar sit us, a stranger. He started talking to his friends about insectoids and reptilian people. I laughed a bit, asked if he listened to Time Suck. He said he hadn't. Then I went on about how awesome this podcast was, about how the hilarious host talks about the lizard people who supposedly rule the world. This is where my encounter went awry. He started to tell me about how... <laughs> this is not... <laughs> I know this is not funny in some ways, but it is... He started to tell me about his, how his doctors thought he had moderate schizophrenia, but he knew the truth. He didn't need to be on meds. These people were giving him because he really was part lizard. It was then I turned to my boyfriend and I, they helped me. The strange lizard person asked me about the podcast again. I told him, yes, you had the name correct. And he said he would check it out. This is where my apology comes in. You are probably going to get a very angry email and a damning review on er whichever platform he listens to podcasts on. Again, super duper sorry. Secondly, I'm new to the suck. I'm listening to the backlog to catch up. I hope I never do because I hope this awesomeness keeps going. I recently listened to Triumph over Unbelievable Tragedy and it hit a chord. Three years ago, I was diagnosed with lung cancer despite the fact that I've never smoked a day in my life. I'm the only person in my family that doesn't smoke and I get lung cancer. Life dealt me a shitty hand, but it turned everything around for me. I took a long, hard look at my life and in the middle of the physical and financial tribulations, I turned my life around. I left an abusive relationship published a book, found strength I never knew I had. I'm three years away from cancer now, still struggling with the after effects. You're done with cancer, but it's not always done with you. I lost a job I love because I physically couldn't do the work anymore. Had to drop out of college due to a reduced income. I dealt with physical problems. I started a GoFundMe at one point, but then deleted it because I didn't have social media to promote it. 
All the problems uh, I'm struggling with aside, I have also found a life I greatly enjoy. I'm going back to school soon, so if you need research, uh, this future research help, this future history teacher has got your back. I found a man that loves me and show it shows every day. I found a job that appreciates the hard work I put into it. Also, a couple awesome podcasts to listen to while I go about my day. Creeper for life. Uh, what all these unnecessary words adds up to are fuck cancer and be glad each and every day you woke up. Oh, that's awesome. Sorry for the long message, but that one hit home. If you could please suck the healthcare system in this country and whether or not national healthcare would fix all of our problems, that would be great. Hail Nimrod. Thanks for all the fun. P.S. What is the name of Joe's band? I'm a little bit of a metalhead and would love some new rock. That's the question I was thinking of earlier about answering. A uh, great message, Ashley. No apologies necessary. I hope your new lizard friend writes a hilariously negative review. That would amuse me greatly. Congrats on kicking cancer in the dick, fighting to improve your life. How inspiring. Uh, glad you're in such a good place. Thanks for the research offer. We're, we've got good support at the moment, but you know, you never know when you're going to need more help. Uh, and Joe's band is Moretta. Uh, not for me, but I, uh, some people like it. JK! Ha! Gosh dang. Uh, you'll love him. <laughs> you'll love him. No, seriously, check out Moretta and Big Pharma and the healthcare system is a suck. We, we've ha we have to do someday. Absolutely. And, and just, you know, the, the possibility of like socialized medicine. Now going to end on some local love from a rural Northwest meat sack like myself, Amanda Woods. Amanda writes, hello to the one with too many titles and nicknames. Fair. I've been slowly making my way through Time Suck and all of the Scared to Death podcasts. I just wanted to say that it's really cool and honestly inspiring to listen to someone who is also from the area where I grew up. I'm from Baker. Hearing for the first time that you were from Riggins shocked me. No one is from the middle of nowhere. All we have is guns and forest fires. Listen, <laughs> listening to someone pronounce things the same way I do has been way more fun than it should be. I'm so glad. Uh, it's a small, in, in, uh, it's a small inconsequential thing to be from the same general area, but it's a nudge of encouragement towards my own success during a time when every little bit of encouragement helps. Thank you for the inspiration and thank you for keeping my brain occupied while I work tedious uh, nights as an essential worker. I stock shelves. It's not exactly glamorous. Most of all, thanks for sucking. Three out of five stars. Hail Lucifina. Shout out to the queen. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, man, I'm guessing you're from the metropolis of Baker City. Uh, very similar culture to Riggins, even if some in Riggins would consider you to be living in the big city, a whopping 10,000 city folk. Uh, I've driven through Baker City many times. Very cute town. Uh, I'm glad <laughs> that you understand why I talk like I do. You get it. You, we live in the land of, of mush mouths. Happy you enjoy the connection. Uh, happy uh, able to provide a little inspiration. Hope it serves you well. Keep on stalking, Amanda, and all of you. Keep on sucking. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. More Bad Magic Productions content coming the rest of the week. Spooks with Scared to Death late Tuesday night. Silliness with Is We Dumb Wednesdays, noon Pacific time. Uh, please do not recruit an army of coked up child soldiers this week and pressure them to eat other children. It is so much easier to just keep on sucking. <laughs> I don't know, man. I feel different after that one.